Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming out today, and uh, thank you for uh, being part of the course. This is the inaugural course, or the first course that uh, goes over the guidelines in upper tract urethial carcinoma. And so I'm pleased to be able to represent a panel of experts that we brought together uh, that'll help us to kind of walk through the guidelines uh, you know, in a practical way and do that uh, along with case presentation. So I'm gonna start off um, by going through the, uh, the, the course questions that we start with. So these are questions that we ask you to uh, answer and address. So um, I think we have to go to the, do I go to the next slide here? There we go. So uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Coleman. I'm um, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, we have Hong Trong, who's here from uh, Penn State. Uh, Jay Raman, also from Penn State. Uh, and Jeannie Hoffman Census from Hopkins. Uh, and we're here to help uh, walk you through this course in, in, uh, in uh, upper tract disease. Uh, so the learning objectives, I'll put them up briefly here, is basically to apply a standardized uh, approach to evaluate upper tract disease, identify pre-surgical risk factors that are shown to be associated with aggressive disease, and describe the rationale and evidence and appropriate scenarios for recommending uh, neoadjuvant adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, explaining scenarios for considering organ sparing management. So organ sparing management is now a new part of the guideline that is uh, that's codified and, and defined. Um, and then describe data on the oncologic impact of node dissection, uh, techniques for surgery, and then uh, talk about new directions that are under development. So if you would please scan the QR code, I'll stop here for a moment so people can put this on their phone. Uh, if you scan this in, this will take you to the, uh, the, the automated questions that we'll do in just a minute. So we have no, the polling we're going to do during this is going to be mostly hand raising and it's going to be, uh, you know, interactive. So we want you people to come to the microphone, ask questions. People are on the chat or online. They can do it uh, through the chat and we'll address those uh, separately. So the first pretest question. So here's one uh, we'd like you to go through. So this is a 34 year old man. He comes to you with painless, gross hematuria. Uh, and he has a CT uh, urogram, which reveals a enhancing seven millimeters soft tissue mass in the left renal pelvis in his a normal appearing right kidney. His voided cytology is negative. Uh, there are no high grade cells found. And the office cystoscopy that you do that day demonstrates that there's some light blood coming out of the left ureteral orifice, the same side where the CT showed a, a lesion. Uh, and what is your recommended next step for this patient? Um, should you take this patient directly to NephroU? Uh, should you do a bilateral ureteroscopy with possible biopsy and ablation of anything that you find? Um, should you do just a left ureteroscopy and a possible biopsy and complete ablation of any tumor that you see? So sort of similar to B, but only the one side. A diagnostic left ureteroscopy, so looking up the left ureter, followed by the initial placement of a stent, or sorry, of an access sheath and selective cytology. So would you go in with a sheath, put it up in this ureter, this native ureter, and, um, and, uh, and, treat and get a selective cytology but not treat anything? Or would you place a left ureteral stent for two weeks and then follow that by diagnostic ureteroscopy? So um, you can answer that question. So what's the recommended next step? should be on your phone to be able to address that. So I'll give you guys a minute here. All right, the votes are still coming in. So I will now go on to the next one. So uh, your colleague uh, refers your patient and says that uh, they have a history of a prior cystectomy that they had performed with an ileal conduit, and they have a newly identified right hydronephrosis uh, that was seen on a scan. And there is a soft, fill soft tissue filling defect within the right ureter, and they have a peristomal hernia. So there's, um, there's some uh, obstructive problem with the, with the stoma. There's a, um, there's a 23 millimeter paracaval lymph node, so a fairly large lymph node seen on the scan, and then you, he'd, he'd happened to get a PET scan because he was curious about this, and the PET scan was positive for that node. Uh, the labs revealed that his GFR was poor, it was 42, and a percutaneous biopsy was done of the mass because they didn't want to go through the conduit, it seemed complicated, so they did a percutaneous biopsy of the, of the, uh, of the node, and it came back positive for high-grade disease. What do you do next? Um, do you place a nephrostomy tube uh, through the flank and hydrate that patient and repeat their labs? Uh, do you refer the patient to nephrology to prepare them for possible dialysis because you're thinking you're going to take this patient's kidney out and they're probably going to go on to dialysis afterwards? Um, do you do a, a ureteroscopy through the conduit and a laser tumor ablation for a mass in the upper tract? Um, or do you proceed with a uh, nephroureterectomy in this patient with a positive lymph node and, um, and a lymphadenectomy and try and repair the peristomal hernia at the same time? 
Uh, or do you consider neoadjuvant gemcitabine, cisplatinum chemotherapy in this patient who has a poor GFR? So you can answer those questions now. All right, go to the next one. So this one, 73-year-old woman who has high-grade upper tract disease that involves the right ureter and the renal pelvis with evidence of parenchymal invasion. So this is obviously an invasive tumor. And she's worried about her long-term prognosis. And she comes to you and says, I'm interested in adjunctive treatment options either before or after surgery because I've read about this online and it sounds like high-stage upper tract urethral carcinoma is really bad. Um, so which of the following is the most likely to impact your recommendation? Um, that she also has high-grade T1 tumor in her bladder. So now she's got multiple different sites. Um, her baseline GFR is less than 60. Um, she has a history of diabetes. You know, is that something that, that precludes her getting uh, certain types of therapy? Um, she has a family history of gastric cancer. Uh, so there's a strange family history thing going on here. Or she has a history of alopecia, meaning that you know, uh, potentially chemotherapies could worsen some of her, uh, her medical issues. So if she was saying, what, what are my risks of getting uh, chemotherapy? What, what's the problem that uh, I have a risk for? So what's most likely to influence uh, what your, your recommendation might be? So we'll give you time to answer that. Okay. So here, uh, which of the following cases is most appropriate for uh, initial endoscopic treatment for upper tract disease? So you have a number of patients that come to you in your practice and you have to say, well, which one would be the best of these that you would uh, offer initial treatment for? So a 54-year-old man with high-grade bladder cancer who has newly discovered low-grade upper tract tumors and has a selective cytology which is actually positive for high-grade cells in the upper tract. Or a 36-year-old woman who has Lynch syndrome. She has a two-centimeter low-grade tumor in the lower ureter down near the bladder that's causing moderate to severe hydronephrosis. You know, would you do endoscopic management for that, for that patient? Uh, a 93-year-old patient comes in in a wheelchair uh, with oxygen um, and has, is being pushed around by their, by their nephew. He's a former smoker, has dementia, and he's incidentally discovered one centimeter lower pole enhancing renal pelvic lesion. Um, he has a normal voided cytology and a solitary uh, three millimeter low-grade bladder tumor that you do in the office. So you look in the office, find a low-grade bladder tumor, and he's got a, a fairly innocuous looking tumor in the, in the kidney. Um, a 62-year-old woman who has previously treated low-grade upper tract disease, so you've treated her in the past and you've given her mitomycin therapy, but she was lost to follow-up and she didn't come back to you for three years. And she now comes in with gross hematuria and has a two centimeter renal pelvis mass uh, diffuse ureteral thickening and mild hydronephrosis, and she has multiple papillary tumors, uh, so a non-compliant patient. Uh, or a 73-year-old man with a history of right nephroidectomy. He has a three-centimeter low-grade T1 uh, upper tract disease, who now presents with a two-centimeter, 2.2-centimeter solitary low-grade tumor in his solitary kidney with an atypical selective cytology and a normal office cystoscopy. So which would be uh, the best candidate for endoscopic management? Okay. And our last one. So a uh, 68-year-old woman, and she's undergoing a right nephro-U for high-grade upper tract disease involving the renal pelvis and the proximal ureter. So it's not just the renal pelvis, but the top third of the ureter, and what's the minimal extent of the node dissection? So should she have the paracaval, retrocaval, and the interaocaval nodes on the right side? And should she have her right obturator and external iliac nodes removed, so pelvic node dissection? Um, or uh, essentially the same dissection, so retrocaval, precaval, interaocaval, right common iliac, and external iliac. Uh, so again, a, a little bit more of the, of the pelvic node dissection. Or should she have a paracaval, right common iliac, and an external iliac, which again, are the part of the pelvic nodes. Uh, or paracaval, precaval, and retrocaval only, so just in that area, and not including the common iliacs. Uh, or a renal hilar nodes only. <laughs> 
I got six questions, I forgot. So <laughs> this is the following, um, which of the following tests can be universally used to identify Lynch syndrome in patients with upper tract? Would you look at P53, uh, which is a genomic marker? Would you look at uh, high-grade urine cytology as a marker for, for Lynch syndrome? Uh, urinary fluorescence uh, studies, so fish studies from the urine? Uh, or mismatch repair immunohistochemistry for tumors, which is a immunohistochemistry t-test uh, looking for mismatch repair genes, or just look at MSH6 as a single gene that you might look at for germline DNA. Good. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to go with the intro slides, the first one. So again, this is designed to be minimally didactic. We really want to talk with you guys. We want to share uh, and exchange ideas. Uh, so that's the, the, the goal of what we're trying to do today. So hopefully um, we can get through that. These are our disclosures, really none that are actually relevant to the uh, talk today. Um, we've talked about the course outline, but this is what we're going to go through with a brief intro. We're going to talk about initial evaluation and diagnosis of upper tract disease. Risk stratification, the new risk stratification process now for upper tract. Uh, endoscopic management, we're going to go through that in some detail in terms of how that's done. Talk about multidisciplinary care, the role of neoadjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapies and working together with your colleagues in medical oncology in, in what setting. And then a bit about surgical management, the practical aspects of, you know, what do we do when we have to uh, address th these uh, cases surgically. And then briefly we'll talk about follow-up and the, the new follow-up schedule which is now being used for following patients after management. This is a case-based discussion, so we're going to go through cases with you guys. We're going to talk about th things that we see normally in the office. Uh, we're going to provide some details that we're going to go through with you. We'll have a discussion, and then we're asking you actively to come to the microphone. If you have a question, raise your hand or things like that if you want to go through things. I want to just go through some background, you know, just so we all understand what we're dealing with with upper tract disease. It's a very rare cancer. It's more rare than testis cancer, so we see only about six to 7,000 cases per year in the United States. Smoking is a major risk factor, but there are others. Uh, having bladder cancer is a risk factor for upper tract, as we all know. Other things like radiation exposure, chronic inflammation, uh, chemical exposures, and specifically uh, Lynch syndrome, and we'll talk about that during the, the talks today. Uh, distinguishing features, so how is upper tract different than lower tract? You're gonna hear some cases where, you know, certain types of therapies don't really, they work well for the bladder, but not in the upper tract for some reason. Why is that? It's a different disease, actually. It's a different di disease genetically. Uh, it's a different disease embryologically. It comes from a different part of your uh, embryologic uh, uh, tract. It doesn't, you know, the bladder comes off of the, the cloaca, so it's part of the uh, the uh, mesoderm, or the endoderm. The, the mesoderm is what comes, uh, develops the upper tract, so it's completely different embryologic logic structure. You'll see more high-grade disease in upper tract than in the bladder. Uh, there are rare, it's rare to find subtypes like micropapillary and upper tract disease where we see them in, in bladder cancer. And some of the known causative factors here don't really cause bladder cancer, but they do cause upper tract disease. Aristoloic acid, which is a, a, called birthwort, is a, a contaminant which can get into drinking water and arsenic can do the same and can cause upper tract disease, really doesn't cause bladder cancer. And um, as far as uh, when we talk about, you know, what, what are the major drivers of this disease? Well, it's grade. This is what grade looks like in terms of survival. This is old data. This is before we were using neoadjuvant therapies for patients. So pure, you know, this is what happens when a patient comes in your office and says, I have high grade disease. What's my prognosis if, if you take my kidney out tomorrow? Well, that's what it looks like with, with surgery alone. And that's the bottom line, 50% five year survival rate for patients with high grade upper tract disease. So high grade defines a high risk cohort. Staging, just so we're all on the same page when it comes to staging. This is staging for upper tract disease, very similar to bladder. However, the, the lining between the urethelium and the muscle is much thinner, and the muscle itself is also thinner. So when patients develop stage two disease, it's a much more serious uh, problem. What's the impact of hydronephrosis? So this upper slide here, uh, oops, I don't know why that went forward or back. Um, so this upper slide here, um, uh, shows the impact of hydronephrosis in low-grade disease as far as prognosis and the impact for high-grade disease in, in the bottom uh, line. And then just to talk briefly about the Paris reporting system, people ask about cytology. What do I do with atypical cytology, low-grade, so on and so forth? There is now a codified process for this, okay? The atypical cytology that we used to kind of get all the time is less of a factor nowadays. We still get it occasionally, but really the question of suspicion for high-grade disease is, is a major indicator for, for risk. So with that, I'll end and hand things over to Dr. Trong, and she's going to go over the initial management. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hong Trong. I am a uh, urologic oncologist at the Penn State Hershey. 
So the objective of my talk today, I would like to walk you through the initial evaluation of a patient with upper tract tumor, standardized reporting of uh, endoscopic evaluation, a way for us to communicate the information in a consistent way, techniques for biopsy of upper tract tumor. How do we risk stratify patient with upper tract tumor? Because that will dictate how we will manage patient and genetic evaluation of patient with upper tract tumor. And I'm going to do it through two cases of patient that I manage myself. So the first case is a 65-year-old woman who presented to me with intermittent painless gross hematuria for two months. So what is the initial evaluation of a patient uh, in this scenario? Um, it involves a complete history and physical exam uh, examinations. What is a complete history? It's involved not just past medical history, but prior history of um, cancer, prior chemotherapy and radiation. We know that certain chemotherapy predisposed to ureterial cancer, such as cyclophosphamide. History of bladder cancer, recurrent urinary tract infection, surgical history, social history, such as smoking, the highest risk of uh, urothelial cancer, occupational exposure. Um, do they, have they been a painter? Have they been exposed to petroleum uh, uh, dry cleaning material? Family history. So, you know, as urologists uh, working with medical oncologists and geneticists, you know, they consistently telling me that we don't take good history and, you know, they're not wrong. What is a good history, family history? It involves ancestry. Is patient have Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry? If they're European, are they from the Balkan Peninsula where they may be predisposed to uh, Balkan nephropathy? Three generation pedigree. You know, the, not just the patient, their parents, their grandparents, children, um, aunt, uncle. And not just whether or not they have family history of urologic cancer, but other type of cancer. What type? What stage of diagnosis when they, did they die from the disease and the age of onset? We know that there is certain common features in hereditary cancer syndrome, and that's being early age of onset, or there are multiple cancer in one side of the family. And lab, CBC, BMP to assess for renal function, LFT. So going back to the case, um, this woman have history of HIV, Hep C, severe scoliosis, and you appreciate it on her cascade, I will show. Chronic thrombocytopenia, her platelet is chronically in the 40. No prior surgery. She's Hispanic. Her father had prostate cancer, stage and grade unknown. Her mother with cancer of unknown origin. She has two sisters with breast cancer diagnosed at standard age of onset. Uh, social history, she smoked two pack per day for 15 years. She quit over 40 years ago. She worked in a clothing warehouse, leave alone uh, two supportive children, good baseline renal function. So this brings us to statement number one of the guideline. For patients with suspected upper tract urothelial cancer, a cystoscopy and cross-sectional imaging of upper tract with contrast with delayed images of the collecting system should be performed. Now, if this sounds familiar, it should be because this is just standard workup for gross hematuria. So the uh, preferred um, evaluation is CT urogram. If patients have good renal function and they don't have severe contrast allergy, MR urogram, if um, uh, CT is not possible, and if MRI and CT urogram are not possible, then CT with our IV contrast. But keep in mind that we need to investigate the upper tract at the time of cystoscopy. Renal ultrasound is uh, potentially a, a alternative to CT scan. And why do we do this? Because at the time of diagnosis, concurrent bladder cancer and upper tract happen in about 17% of patients. So what did I do for this lady? I got a CT urogram. But uh, you know, I choose to show you the uh, contrast in hand phase because as you can appreciate, uh, on here there is a um, enhancing mid ureter mass in her mid ureter as well as a mass in her bladder. So see, you know, the statistics is low, but she's one of those 17% uh, who present with concurrent bladder and upper tract cancer, and you can appreciate. Her, scol her severe scoliosis, her aorta is uh, not pointing where it should be pointing. So I counsel her about cystoscopy, bringing her to the operating room for uh, transurethral resection of bladder tumor, ureteroscopy, partial biopsy, and definitely a stent placement. And this is what I found in the operating room. I found a uh, papillary, and there was some component, sessile bladder tumor, as well as an obstructing uh, mid-ureteral tumor. <coughs> 
So over the next couple of slides, we're going to go over the issues of should we investigate her other side that the p k of normal on the CAT scan? How are we going to manage the bladder tumor? How are we going to biopsy a tumor like this in the ureter? And um, uh, the, uh, Dr. Raman will go over endoscopic ablation. So statement num number two, clinicians should evaluate patients with suspected upper tract with diagnostic ureteroscopy and biopsy of any identified lesion and cytologic washing from the upper tract system being inspected. Now, how do we biopsy an upper tract tumor? There's multiple approach, and the approach should depend on the tumor, the location, patient factor. There's endoscopic approach where we can do percutaneous anti-grade ureteroscopy and biopsy. We can do retrograde, um, like most of us do. If that's not possible, we can do percutaneous uh, CT-guided biopsy. That's usually involve our colleague in radi interventional uh, radiology. And then if we do do endoscopic, ureteroscopic approach, um, there's many tools in our toolbox for biopsy. We can do a brush biopsy, uh, piranha forceps versus flat wire basket. So on the top here, you can see the piranha forceps. It's a small forceps. It fits through the ureteroscope, but it's also don't, um, unless the patient have a uh, nice little stock where we can grasp at the, the, the bottom of the tumor, I sometimes find that I don't get very uh, satisfactory biopsy from that. There's the flat wire basket, which is a steel wire cutting basket and a large papillary tumor. You know, um, this is actually my preferred uh, approach because I can get a good chunk of tissue that not only give me a diagnosis, but my, uh, I can ask the pathologist to do uh, uh, mismatch repair deficient staining, give me a little bit more information about the patient tumor. And then if uh, there's laser fulguration option using homium laser, to, uh, Dr. Raman will go over a different laser setting. And um, if all that is not possible, there's always a selective cytology and palpitage. And usually we use a combination of these techniques. And Dr. Coleman, so this Paris system for reporting urine cytology before, and this should be how our pathologists should report the finding to us. This is not, this is a standardized pathology reporting uh, criteria. One is non-diagnostic, unsatisfactory uh, biopsy result. Two is negative for high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Three is atypical urothelial cell. Four is suspicious for high-grade urothelial carcinoma high-grade urothelial carcinoma or low-grade urothelial neoplasm, and seven is other malignancy that may be involving the upper tract secondary malignancy. And uh, from my perspective, you know, four and five, um, I treat them pretty similarly, suspicious or high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Guideline number three. In patients who have concomitant lower urinary, urinary tract tumors, such as one in the bladder and urethra discovered at the time of ureteroscopy, the lower urinary tract tumor should be managed in the same setting as ureteroscopy. So in my patient who present with both upper tract and lower tract tumor, my question for the audience is how many in here would investigate the upper tract, you know, do your biopsy before you do TURBT? I would just have a show of hand. Interesting. And how many would do TURBT and then worry about the upper tract after once you take care of the bladder tumor? Okay, so about half and half. So my question to Dr. Raman or Dr. Coleman is, you know, why do you choose to do TURBT before managing the upper tract? Um, I, I don't think I have a great reason other than you know, once you start working in the upper tract, you have to put a wire up to the upper tract, and then once you've started doing upper tract endoscopy, there's some inevitable bleeding that's coming from the upper tract. So I think more about doing the bladder first, just out of convenience. I can see better. Uh, the whole bladder hasn't been distended on and off due to the upper tract manipulation. I don't think there's any hard data that says you have to do one or the other. I think it's for myself more just the convenience of seeing well in the bladder before I start dealing with the upper tract. I mean, I think the point here is, you know, the guidelines recommend management of these tumors at the same time, but certainly different people have different approach that you're comfortable with, and I don't think that uh, we can come to a consensus about which one is the optimal approach here. 
case uh, guideline statement number four. In case of existing ureteral structure or difficult access to the upper tract, clinicians should minimize risk of ureteral injury by using gentle dilation techniques such as stenting and limiting the use of aggressive uh, ureteral access sheets. So in, in cases where I'd have difficulty, just such in this case where, you know, it was all obstructing, I couldn't get the ureteroscope up, I placed the stains and I got a urine cytology because in her, it looked high grade, it looked suspicious and, you know, see her platelet is low. I did give her a platelet stimulating agent beforehand, but I didn't want to risk uh, bleeding in this patient. Guideline number five. In case where ureteroscopy cannot safely be performed, an attempt at selected upper tract brushing or proper test for cytology may be made, and rectal grade pilogram performed in cases where good quality imaging such as CT urogram is not possible. Again, this going back to the initial evaluation, we have to be able to assess the upper tract um, somehow. So if patient cannot CT urogram, then we need to perform uh, rectal grade pilos, uh, pilogram at the time of uh, cystoscopy. Statement number six, at the time of ureteroscopy for suspected upper tract ureterial carcinoma, clinicians should not perform ureteroscopic inspection of a radiographically normal and clinically normal contralateral upper tract. Now this makes sense, right, because we can see tumor cell from the bladder into a normal contralateral upper tract. And at the same time, you know, there's also additional risk of ureteroscopy or evaluation of the, an, an otherwise normal, tra um, normal upper tract. And we know that the incidence of bilateral upper tract tumor is, is quite low, less than 5%. So there's no reason to suspect a patient with normal uh, uh, CT urogram on one side would need to be investigated. Statement number nine, at the time of identify upper tract tumor, clinicians should perform a standardized assessment documenting clinically meaningful endoscopic and radiographic feature to facilitate clinical staging and risk assessment. What does that mean? So this is what this means. Uh, this is the uh, uh, standard reporting that the guideline recommended and uh, you know you can um, easily integrated into a, you know, a dot phase in EPIC or, uh, uh, you know, whatever EMR system that you use. So first of all, you know, document the approach. Did you do retrograde? Did you do integrate? Was there a bladder lesions? Uh, was there a ureteral lesion? Where is the ureteral lesion? What does it look like? Does it look papillary, sessile, or flat? Is there one tumor or there multiple tumor? And this I find very helpful because for me, I like to, when I um, evaluate a patient for subsequent ureteroscopy, it's helpful to, for me to know where and how many tumor the patient have to, uh, the size, you know, um, how big is the tumor? Now this is difficult to evaluate size in upper tract tumor and there's like several techniques, but I don't think there's a standard ways of doing it. You can use the piranha forcep. Uh, to kind of give an estimate of the size. Um, is there obstruction? Did you biopsy the tumor? Likewise, you know, did you find a tumor in the renal pelvis? Um, and then is there any other ancillary test that you did, like bladder cytology, upper tract washing? Um, did you perform a cystogram? How big is the patient bladder? This is likely if you contemplate a distal ureterectomy with ureteral reimplant. So, this is the next, uh, the next audience uh, engagement that I like to have. So, you know, this is to show, um, you know, some of the uh, subjectiveness of describing a tumor. So what would, uh, what would everyone call this first finding over here? Just someone shout something. Erythema, yeah, yeah, flat, flat, yes sir. And what about this, uh, this tumor over here? Yeah, so uh, no, no, pretty, um, yeah, I think most of us would agree this is papillary. What about this one? Yeah, and now what about this one? <laughs> Mixture, yeah, yeah. So there's some, there's some, um, you know, subjectivity to how we call a papillary sessile tumor, or sometimes we call a combination of both. But, you know, I think sometimes a lot of the documentation is a way to communicate with yourself, um, you know, because you're going to be the person who manages this patient going forward. So, you know, as long as it's consistent. 
So in this patient, how I would uh, report her her endoscopy, and you know this was before the guideline come out. So I, I included all of these features, but not in this nice format, obviously. Uh, so uh, you know it was a retrograde approach. I did do a ureteroscopy, see so have a bladder lesion. I did a complete TURBT. I usually indicate whether I did a complete or incomplete TURBT just for my uh, own um, knowledge when I see patient back, uh, whether or not I need to schedule them for a uh, second. Uh, TRBT. Uh, she did have a ureteral tumor. It was located in her mid ureter. It was both a combination of what I consider papillary and sessile. Um, there was multifocal, so even though you see one obstructing tumor, when I put the ureteroscope up to that, I see multiple stalk. Um, it was greater than two centimeter. This was based both on her CT scan and also on my radiographic evaluation. It was obstructing. I did not biopsy it. I did get a urine cytology. I did not go up to the upper tract. I placed a right ureteral stain. I did not perform a uh, cystogram. So now this is another scenario. This go to the question of does everybody need ureteroscopic evaluation? So this is a 64-year-old man who presented to me with gross hematuria. But as you can appreciate here, he has an obstructing tumor in his renal pelvic. That's a uh, delay contrast phase. Um, and right here, you can see it's occupied the entire renal pelvis. But over here, he have a large paraaortic lymph node. And for me, you know, the paraaortic lymph node information is more uh, helpful uh, uh, diagnostic for me. But so let me just uh, pose it to the audience: How many patient? How many people would biopsy this patient pelvic tumor? Okay. How many would biopsy the paraaortic lymph node? Okay. How many people would do both? All right. And how many people would do cystoscopy in this gentleman? Should be everybody, right? <laughs> Let me just talk about this. Um, so in this case, I did do a cystoscopy. There was no bladder tumor. I, I just did a CT-guided biopsy. I mean, I refer him for CT-guided biopsy of the paraaortic lymph node. It turned out to be metastatic high-grade urothelial carcinoma. I staged him with a chest CT. There was no pulmonary nodule. I don't typically get a PET scan unless there's suspicions of, um, you know, uh, other metastasis. And I did refer a patient for chemotherapy, you know, in a patient with no positive disease. We do surgery, we'll take out something, but we will not cure the patient with surgery up front. Uh, guideline statement number 10, following standardized assessment, clinicians should risk stratify patient as low or high risk for invasive disease based on obtained endoscopy, cytologic, pathologic, radiographic finding. Further stratification into favorable and unfavorable risk groups should be based on standard identified feature. And this is how we would risk stratify patient. And you know, what, this will decide the patient phase going forward. I tell every patient, you know, um, diagnosis is just as important, if not more important than treatment. I can give them very good treatment for the wrong diagnosis and it's not going to do them any good. So what are the risk category? There's low versus high risk, and even within low and high risk, there are favorable and unfavorable risk group. Uh, and how do we decide that? Number one, cytology. So low-grade low cytology, uh, negative cytology, no high-grade, and it's a low risk group. Uh, radiographic evaluation, is there evidence of invasion into the renal parenchyma or the, uh, uh, the, the fat around the renal pelvis or the ureter? Is there obstruction? Uh, are the node normal? If this no, you know the node looks suspicious, then the patient have high uh, high risk disease. Appearance: Is it unifocal? Is it multifocal? Uh, is this papillary or sessile tumor? You, we worry more about a sessile or flat tumor because they pertain high grade. And then once you establish the risk group, then you know the treatment option would be different. Um, so low risk group ablative treatment uh, are the preferred option for a kidney sparing approach. Uh, and then the role of systemic therapy in high risk group, uh, patients should really get a neoadjuvant uh, uh, adjuvant systemic therapy as part of their multimodal uh, cancer treatment. <laughs> 
So how do I apply this to my patient? She has high risk, unfavorable uh, upper tract cancer. Why? Because she has high grade invasion uh, cyto on cytology. She has clear obstruction on CT scan. It was multifocal disease on my ureteroscopy. She has both sessile and papillary lesions. So the ideal treatment for her is, um, you know, if she can have it, systemic therapy or palliative option. So this brings us to guideline 18. Clinician may offer watchful waiting or surveillance alone to select patients with upper tract cancer with significant comorbidity, competing risk of mortality, and a significant risk of end-stage renal disease with any intervention resulting in dialysis. Um, so uh, you know, there's two studies. One is based on the SEER database, and one is based on the NCDB uh, database, and they actually both by the same group. Looking at non-surgical management versus uh, surgery for patients with uh, high grade upper tract cancer. And what, you know, this is not surprising to any of us that, you know, patient who is managed non-surgically have, um, you know, worse median overall survival and uh, three-year cancer-specific survival. But, you know, there is also risk of treatment, you know, nephro-ureterectomy for those of us who do it is not a, um, you know, benign surgery. Patient can, can have a pretty uh, significant uh, morbidities from the procedure. So we have to keep that in mind. And this is the reason why I choose this case, because, you know, this brings me to the issue with her competing risk of mortality. You know, my patient had uh, HIV and AIDS. She didn't have any AIDS-defining illness, but her CD4 count was 120, lower than 200. Uh, she had liver cirrhosis, her male score. So this is based on her liver disease alone. You know, 30-day mortality is like 2%. 90-day mortality rate is 4%, just from liver disease. And she have, I did send her for a cardiac stress test, and she have inducible ischemia on nuclear stress test. So I have multiple meetings with her and her family, and we you know, talk about all the pro and con of treatment and patient uh, elected for uh, surveillance of her upper tract disease. You know, I manage her with interval TURBT to make sure that you know, she doesn't have gross hematuria, and I exchange her stains. But um, you know, we, did, we decided that nephrouridorectomy uh, for her was not a good option. So this is another case, um, and you know, I'd be curious to see what the audience here think. 73 years old man referred to me for radical cystectomy for BCG refractory bladder CIS. He has CIS in his right trigone. Um, you know, this is uh, before he see me. He got a course of BCG, induction BCG, cytology comeback, high-grade urothelial carcinoma. Um, he uh, underwent a uh, systematic bladder biopsy and prostatic urethral biopsy, and what turned out positive is just CIS in the right trigone. He underwent a second course of induction BCG, and again, cytology was high-grade uh, urothelial carcinoma. His urologist did an office systole that saw persistent erythema over the right trigone and right lateral bladder wall. How many patients, uh, how many, how many uh, of the audience would take this patient now for radical cystectomy? Okay. Um, how many would do something else? Okay. What would you do, sir? I would evaluate the upper tracks before being radical cystectomy. Absolutely. And uh, that's why I did. I took him for cystoscopy, bladder biopsy. Uh, fulguration of the bladder. I took bi bilateral selective urine cytology before I, I do ureteroscopy, and I did do a right ureteroscopy. So in his um, bladder, there was uh, in the right trigone and right lateral bladder wall, there was CIS. The left urine cytology was negative. The right cytology was um, positive for high-grade urethelial carcinoma. Now, you, have, you may ask me why same bilateral selective urine cytology. Well, I did a CT urogram, and both of his upper tract was completely normal. And so my thinking was, you know, if I send a, uh, I did a left cytology kind of like a quality control for myself, because, you know, often you get a typical cytology, and you're like, well, what do I do with this information if both of his upper tract are um, atypical? But his uh, right upper tract did turn out to be high gray and the left was negative. So what I did was I gave him uh, BCG, I put a nephrostomy tube in, I gave him uh, reinduction BCG to the upper tract and I gave him, at the same time, I gave him BCG to the bladder. So he stayed, every BCG treatment was like, 
for six hour ordeal for him. Uh, but you know, I did the um, uh, initial cystoscopy and ureteroscopy after he completed uh, reinduction BCG, and for the first time ever, his cytology was negative and his uh, upper tract cytology was negative. I don't know how long we can maintain that, but you know, I consider that a win for now. But this brings to my point, you know, the risk of my so in patient who present with. Um, uh, upper tract cancer, no bladder cancer at initial evaluation. The risk of bladder cancer development later on is at 22 to 47 percent. So don't forget the, the bladder in the setting of upper tract and don't forget about the upper tract in the setting of bladder cancer because that could be a reservoir for, your, uh, for why patient may fail uh, intravesical t therapy. Now, uh, this brings to the last topic, which is one of my favorite topics, is genetics in patients with uh, urologic cancer. Statements, uh, guideline statement number seven say, for patients with suspected uh, or diagnosed upper tract cancer, clinicians should obtain a personal and family history to identify known hereditary risk factor for familial disease, such as those with Lynch syndrome, for which referral for genetic counseling should be offered. So what are Lynch syndrome? Uh, in the, you know, before it was known as hereditary non-polyposis um, syndrome, but you know, it, as we know more about it, it really is a pain cancer syndrome. It's not just colorectal cancer. It's autosomal dominant. That means all you need is one copy of the gene to have the disease. Um, and the characteristic underlying cause is a pathogenic germline variant and mismatch repair genes. What are they? MSS2, MSS6, PMS2, and MLH1. Now, IPCAM is a uh, MMR gene, but it function in com combination with uh, MSS6. It doesn't just, you know, there's no mutation in IPCAM alone. And what are the tumor phenotype of Lynch syndrome? Mismatch repair deficiency or microsatellite instability height. Now, this is a Lancet Oncology paper, uh, paper, and most of us, when we think of Lynch syndrome, we think of endometrial and colorectal cancer. Upper tract, as rare as this is, um, is actually the third most common cancer associated with Lynch syndrome. Now, put it another way, the incidence of Lynch syndrome is much higher in patients with upper tract cancer than they are in endometrial or colorectal cancer. And how do we know that? Um, well, I'll, maybe the next slide I'll show you. But, but uh, the cumulative risk of upper tract cancer in Lynch syndrome depends on the genes. So um, this is based uh, off of the NCCN guideline, but the risk of upper tract cancer is highest in MSS2 uh, gene mutation, anywhere between 2.2 to 28%. Now, why is the range so wide? Uh, well, you know, these are low numbers, so, so you know, the confidence interval is, is pretty wide. Uh, the next one is MSS6, MLH1, and then PMS2 is on the, uh, the rare side. Now, this is when I was a, uh, a fellow at Memorial. We looked at 232 patients with upper tract cancer who have germline testing over a six-year period. And the incidence of uh, Lynch syndrome that we found in this cohort was 9%. Um, and the most common were MSS2, not surprisingly. But also over 16% of the cohort, so one in six patients have a pathogenic germline variant. 9% have uh, germline mutation in MMR gene. But, you know, why do we care about this? What, you know, what can patients do? Well, it turned out to be a lot. You know, their family history, their family member who don't have cancer can qualify for genetic evaluation often for free. Um, you know, there's a prophylactic surgery to mitigate the risk of uh, cancer development. They may qualify for immunotherapy if they have a Advanced cancer, disease, uh, advanced cancer, and they also there are uh, chemo prophylaxis for colorectal cancer. There's high quality trial of aspirin as a prophylaxis for colorectal development in patients with Lynch syndrome who have not developed colorectal cancer yet. How do you? How do we screen for upper tract cancer in uh, in Lynch syndrome? How do we? Which patients should we refer for Lynch syndrome? Turn out, you know, the the guideline is 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 right. But look at the NCCN guideline here. You know, over fifty percent of people with Lynch syndrome did not meet NCCN guideline criteria. A hundred percent of people who meet the guideline have 
um, germline mutation in an MMR gene, but the guideline is not sensitive. The most sensitive criteria is tumor evaluation either by AISC or next generation sequencing for uh, MSI status. So uh, again, the most sensitive criteria is tumor testing. And uh, this is the last uh, guideline statement. How do you perform, you know, uh, you know pay, if the tumor is available, this should be same for universal histologic evaluation with either immunohistochemical staining. Our pathologists can do this routinely. This is not, this is not new for them. Or microsatellite instability, either with PCR or next generation sequencing. So in summary, I went over the initial evaluation of patient with upper tract cancer, which would include a complete medical history uh, that's involved a complete family history as well. Baseline renal function, cystoscopy, and upper tract evaluation. The high risk of Lynch syndrome in patient with upper tract cancer should make us you know, be more on the lookout for patients with hereditary cancer syndrome and universal testing should be performed, um, you know, and that this, this would be a conversation that you would have with your pathology department to make sure that this is implemented. And follow standardized reporting and risk stratification for, for the patient with upper tract cancer. And we also discuss technique for tissue diagnosis depending on patient and tumor factor. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so what I'm gonna speak to you all about and uh, have some cases on is the whole concept of kidney sparing and kidney preservation and how we should use some of the concepts that Dr. Trong talked about in incorporating um, tissue ablative strategies, whether that's chemo ablation or endoscopic management. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, I am a study site investigator for a number of different uh, biomarker trials. Uh, none of these uh, are pertaining to upper tract and, and they're all just for study investigation, so no financial uh, disclosure in that regard. I also do want to thank, uh, I have a number of videos in my talk because I think videos are helpful to illustrate some of these. Obviously, it's hard to make videos all by yourself, so these are some friends and colleagues who are kind enough to share some videos uh, in incorporating them for this talk today. So I think one of the first things, it's always helpful to know what's our current state and, and maybe how good a job do we do when you look at this concept of preserving the kidney, um, are we accomplishing that goal? And, and I would say the current state is probably not as well as we should be. So this is some data that comes from the National Cancer Database that was published by the UCLA group. And what it basically shows is if you look at over 12,000 tumors that were biopsied as low grade, only about 20% of them are being managed endoscopically. So there's a lot that are undergoing nephroureterectomy or other types of surgery. And again, I'm not gonna tell you that every low-grade tumor should be managed endoscopically, but I would also tell you that maybe 20% is a low number. Sort of parallel to this is some data from a collaborative that we were part of, and this is about 12 years old, but it actually looked at patients who had a nephroureterectomy and reported on outcomes. But if you actually go look at the pathology of the tumors that were removed, about 20% were TA and over a third were low grade. So again, I'm not gonna tell you that every one of these tumors that was TA or low grade should have been managed endoscopically with kidney preservation, but I hazard a guess that there was probably some opportunity to improve on what we were doing. So I'm gonna get, really give you sort of four rationales of why you should think about kidney preservation when you have a patient with upper tract tumors, provided it's appropriate. Number one is, I think we all have to recognize that nephroureterectomy has inherent risk. So this is data that looks at over 800 or over 700 patients and looks at complications after nephroureterectomy. And these are the data that I quote my patients. I tell them almost 40% of these patients may have a complication and it's usually because it's an older comorbid patient population. And about 10% of patients may have a major complication, meaning like a clavian three or higher. Second point is that patients with upper tract cancers, even compared to the general population, tend to have impaired renal function at a baseline. 
Again, they're older, they're comorbid, they probably have some lifestyle habits that have resulted in the development in some cases of their cancer. And not surprisingly, their GFR, their renal function is low. And as we know, even from the kidney cancer literature, when you go and take these patients for an nephroureterectomy and you remove their kidney, their GFR gets even lower and many of them are at significant risk of chronic kidney disease and then the resultant side effects and the sequelae of chronic kidney disease. Reason number three is um, if you look at certain models, nephroureterectomy may actually cost more. So this is some data from the Jefferson group that looked at patients with a solitary kidney. So it was a, a sort of an assumption model, single kidney model, and assumed that the patient had a tumor, an, an upper tract tumor, and said, okay, either nephroureterectomy with dialysis versus endoscopic management, and we're gonna portray the worst case scenario with endoscopic management, which is the patients recur repeatedly over time. And they still found that if you did endoscopic management and the patients recurred, it cost a whole lot less than having a patient with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis if you had to remove the kidney. And the fourth, which really comes from our guideline, is that if you look at series that compare nephroureterectomy versus kidney preservation, um, accepting the fact there's no randomized trials, and obviously those that are undergoing endoscopic management are carefully selected and vetted out, the studies basically showed that you have comparable outcomes and improved renal function outcomes. So the oncologic outcomes are equivalent and the kidney function outcomes are not surprisingly better. So Dr. Chong showed this, and I think we're gonna come back to this theme over and over again, which is I think how you should think about patients who have this disease and how you select treatments is predicated upon what their risk stratification is. So this is that same table. I put a green arrow again on ablative therapies, and I really sort of think about three groups, and I'm gonna kind of color them in a green, yellow, and red group. So statement 13 is gonna be sort of what I call the green group, which is really tumor ablation, should be the initial management for patients with low risk favorable upper tract urothelial cancer. So that's the low risk group are the people in the red box. It's basically low grade cancer. And the preferred option is this one that I highlighted in green, which is really those favorable low grade solitary tumors without any evidence of CT abnormalities outside of the urinary tract and no evidence of bladder involvement. Now, that's sort of the, the ideal group, okay? But we also know that, you know, very, very rarely do people fit into ideal groups and ideal buckets. So there is the ability to use tumor ablation, even in those patients that might be low risk unfavorable, and even a few high risk favorable cohort. And I'm gonna show you some studies that sort of illustrate these points. But again, what is low risk unfavorable? That's gonna be what I call the yellow group, and that's really those patients who, again, have a low-grade tumor, but maybe these tumors are now multifocal. You don't have a single, you have multiple lesions. Maybe these patients also have a history of a bladder tumor as well. And then you get into these rare select scenarios, and I think they are rare and they are select for those patients that have high-risk features, and that's really determined by the fact that they have a high-grade biopsy, but maybe all the other parameters are really acceptable. So they have a high grade tumor, but it's unifocal, it looks papillary, they don't have any bladder involvement, and your CT or other type of axial imaging looks favorable. And, and again, I put this in red because I think there's just unique scenarios where this would be appropriate, but certainly should not be routine practice. So let's sort of try to apply this to a case and, and sort of look at how we can do this. So 63 year old male, gross hematuria, former smoker, good performance status, uh, renal function as measured by creatinine and GFR calculation is normal. So as Dr. Trong mentioned, step one, gross hematuria or hematuria evaluation need to get axial imaging of some sort. This patient had good renal function, so it's CT urogram. It showed a one and a half centimeter filling defect in the lower pole calyx of the left kidney. No other evidence of invasion, no hydronephrosis, no stigmata of lymph node involvement. Cystoscopy, which is part of your hematuria evaluation negative, urinary cytology negative as well. You can see over here, this is a retrograde pilogram showing a rather obvious filling defect in the mid to lower pole, really tracking towards that lower pole infundibulum. So let's go back to our risk stratification. And as we look down, patient had a low grade tumor on biopsy, 
even though it was about two centimeters in size, they really fall into all of these other elements. So they would be considered a low risk patient and then ablative therapies would be considered preferred for this favorable low risk tumor. Now, when we talk about tumor ablation, we talk about endoscopic tumor ablation, so ureteroscopy, percutaneous approach using some energy device, or we talk about chemo ablation, and I'll talk about each of these and, and I'll, I'll ask how many of you are actually doing any of the chemo ablation. There is one FDA approved uh, drug, which is gel mito, which is out on the market, and I'll talk briefly about that. So endoscopic tumor ablation. So um, how many of you do ureteroscopy with tumor ablation? Okay. How many of you use a homium laser? Okay. How many use a thulium laser? How many use neodymium YAG? And how many use a bug bee? Okay. So I would say that um, if you look at the literature, what this audience basically showed is that you can use any one of these and there's no data that suggests objectively that one is better than the other. I think some of it depends on what you have at your hospital, some of it depends on what you're comfortable with, um, and the reality is you can change your approach during different parts of the case. So I have a, a few sort of brief comments, which is I do really think that if you look at lasers, one of the key things is for tissue ablation, so remember these aren't stones, this is actually tissue ablation, you're really looking for something that doesn't necessarily have a large amount of penetrance or coagulative necrosis, particularly if you're using this in the ureter, if you have a large depth of penetration, these patients may develop strictures, even up in the renal unit, if you're using large depth of penetration, you may have significant scarring in the kidney. So I think your thulium and your homium fibers are your mainstay. So I'm gonna talk about each one and, and just sort of go through, you know, as I've polled a lot of people in urology, what people tend to use as their settings uh, for these operations. So remember, the homium is a pulsed laser as a contrast to the thulium, which is a continuous. The laser tip has to be in contact with the tumor tissue. That's a good thing and it's a bad thing. The good thing is it's very controlled. The bad thing is sometimes you'll get some debris that sticks onto the edge or the tip of the laser. And the typical power settings are anywhere between 0.5 and one joule with Hertz going from five to 30. So this is, um, this is a, 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 an example of the luminous 120 watt homium laser with the Moses technology. And what I'm showing here is an example of what's called sort of the short pulse mode. So this is relatively low power, 0.5 to 0.6 joules, and then low hertz, five to 10 hertz. And it's interesting, we were talking about this case yesterday, and I think a lot of upper tract uh, endoscopy is patience and patients in figuring out what works well. So this surgeon is working right now and, and they're using it. And I would say that they are making some very slow progress and uh, they are ablating and now they're starting to change their settings a little bit. You can see now the frequency has gone up from five to 10 Hertz, but they're still not making the type of progress that they want. So at this point you can pivot. And again, there, there's, you, you don't have to be married to a certain power and a certain frequency. So now the surgeon pivots to using higher power, one joule, higher frequency, 30 hertz. And you can see for this particular tumor, much more effective in affecting coagulative necrosis in the tumor, but it does come with a cost. You can see that as soon as the power settings and the frequency have gone up, also at the same time, the visualization is not quite as good. So it is going to be the sweet spot of going back and forth so that you have that balance between maybe ablating more effectively in a shorter amount of time versus being able to see effectively. Now, I did ask how many of you use a neodymium YAG, and a lot of us have lasers that actually can toggle between homium and neodymium. And this is where I think the neodymium actually has value, is that when you get towards the base of the tumor and you've got this bleeding, you can see this video here of some very slow pulsatile bleeding, meaning at the base of the tumor, you can actually flip it over if you have that setting to the neodymium to get that deeper depth of coagulation to sort of clean up the base. And you can see very nicely now at the end of this, that calyx which had that big tumor in it is wide open. So I know some of you raise your hands with the thulium laser fiber, and, and I would say that the advantage of the thulium compared to the homium, although their wavelengths are pretty similar, is that the thulium is a continuous laser fiber. 
So really, in theory, um, it actually has a very shallow and smooth incision. And, and some will argue very compellingly that it is a cleaner with regards to tissue uh, resection and tissue ablation. I, I think that if you look at the prostate literature, for example, they're also doing not the whole laps, but also the full laps. And it's the same sort of argument that's come in for BPH surgery. One of the things that has come up is that there are a number of people that describe that at the base, you can get this carbonization when using the thulium laser. And especially if it's in the ureter, there might be the risk of stricture. So again, I think it depends on how you use it and your power settings and your frequency. Thulium laser, typically power settings are a little higher than what you use for the homium right out of the gate. The frequency is much lower. So this is a really nice video that Mantu Gupta shared with me. This is a ureteral tumor, so he feels quite comfortable using the thulium. And what you can see here, uh, which I think is very attractive with the thulium, is first of all, the uh, relatively um, low frequency and the fact that you don't have this sort of, um, and sort of the cleaner cut gives you a pretty clean field even as you're going through. And you're going to see as they peek around the corner, you can see a very nice smooth ablation going right down to the ureteral wall and very little depth of penetration. So I showed you some pretty pictures, but you can see we're going up the access sheath here. And, and the reality is sometimes it doesn't look pretty. Um, and so, you know, for every one of these beautiful cases where you can see this really pretty endoscopic ablation, this is a case where a biopsy was done, as it should be, and then as we go up the access sheath and we look into the kidney, the area that was biopsied was bleeding, and here the visualization is not very good at all. And I think one of the key aspects here is to first go find the site you biopsied and get the bleeding under control so that your visualization clears up. And then as time goes along, then going and ablating the tumor. So really the key points are not every case looks good, not every case looks pretty. And I think it eventually comes down to first trying to get control so that you can see better and then figuring out what the ablative strategy needs to be. So how many of you use access sheets when you're doing endoscopic ablation? Yeah, I, I really think that, that this is critical, to be perfectly honest. If it's safe to put a sheath up, and Dr. Trong talked about the fact you don't want to force a sheath up and cause perforation because that's really, that's really problematic, especially problematic at a baseline, problematic especially when you're ablating a tumor. But this is, I, I think there are two things I worry about with endoscopic ablation of upper tract tumors. The first is if you have a high pressure in the kidney, you might have pilovenous backflow into the system. And so I do think, and this study shows it very nicely, that the larger the sheath you put in, the lower the intrarenal pressure that you have. And therefore, I think that you have a safer environment and less likelihood of this pilovenous backflow and potential result in risk. I think the other thing is, and this, there's a lot of studies that are published on this, at least three or four. Uh, we were presenting some work at this year's meeting, but I think when you have a sheath in place, there is less likelihood of downstream seeding, both within the kidney, just with the tumor, the tumors just sort of floating, the tumor cells floating around in the renal unit, less seeding in the ureter, and less seeding in the bladder. This is some work that we have shown that shows it's almost a 75% reduction when you compare to those that don't have a sheath. So I think the sheath benefit is lower intrarenal pressures, less likelihood of seeding within the kidney and within the urinary tract. So after you're done ablating a tumor, how many of you would put some sort of agent into the upper tract, like a chemotherapeutic agent? Mitomycin, gemcitabine, B, uh, uh, BCG? Okay. How many of you would put something in the bladder? Mitomycin, gemcitamine. Okay, so let's tackle each of these. So if you look at the guideline statement, the reality is there, there's not a lot of great data. So the, the guideline statement basically says, as long as you haven't had a perforation of the upper tract, you may instill some drug into the upper tract, you may instill some drug into the bladder. And I'm gonna talk, talk about each of these and, and maybe give you some data. So this is a pretty nice review that looked at published series of upper tract ablation. Retrospective, so you know everybody's technique's a little bit different, but I would highlight you in box number one, which just shows doing endoscopic ablation of the upper tract period, giving no drug. Recurrence rates are about 60 to 80%. Then if you look at sort of the purple box, which I've highlighted, which is giving some type of therapy into the upper tract, the numbers are lower. It's probably about 30 to 50%. So I do think that there is some potential value of giving some drug into the upper tract 
as long as you don't have a perforation. But there are challenges. Gravity works against us. Honestly, we don't know the best agent to give up there. Um, we don't know how many installations. Is a single treatment okay, or should you give these persons multiple treatments? But I do believe that there's pretty good information on how we should be giving the drug into the upper tract. So there are really three ways, okay? Dr. Trong talked about one way where you could put in a frosty B tube and drip the drug in. I think you can also put a ureteral stent, like a double J ureteral stent, and then count on reflux. Or you could put a five French ureteral stent and give the drug into the upper tract. And I think this is a really nice paper from Montu Gupta's group. It's almost 10 years old, but what they did was they looked at methylene blue and staining intensity using all three of those modalities. And what they basically found is if you look at surface area coverage of the upper tract, it was better when you used a five French stent and you placed the drug up there in a retrograde manner. It was better than if you re relied on reflux with an indwelling ureteral stent. It was better potentially than if you had a nephrostomy tube in place. So I do believe that if you're gonna give drug in the upper tract, my preference is, and if you're gonna do it in a maintenance sort of regimen, not just at the time that you did the surgery, uh, my preference, my personal practice is I use a five French ureteral catheter. The second concept, um, which I think more of you raise your hands on, is I do believe that bladder seeding occurs after you manage tumors endoscopically in the upper tract. And I do think that there's some easy stuff that can be done in clinical practice to reduce that likelihood. This is a nice study that looked at patients who had, it's retrospective, but patients who had a nephroureterectomy and they did not have a ureteroscopy, so they just went straight up front for nephroureterectomy, maybe based on imaging or cytology versus those that had a ureteroscopy and then went on to an FRU. And the pooled analysis basically showed if you had a ureteroscopy before the FRU, your likelihood of developing a bladder tumor was one and a half times higher. Okay, one and a half times higher. And that was irrespective of whether you went up and endoscopically ablated the tumor or you just wanted to take a peek up there and make sure that that was an upper tract tumor and you really didn't do much more than just biopsy it and maybe fulgurate it. So the extent of manipulation didn't matter. So I really do believe that downstream seeding occurs. I think there's some good data in the bladder cancer literature that obviously shows that giving drug in the bladder after a TUR resection decreases the likelihood. And I tend to use gemcitabine because gemcitabine is ch relatively cheap, it's inert. And so at the end of a ureteroscopy case, if I have visualized an upper tract tumor or I've ablated an upper tract tumor, I put a catheter at the end of the case, I put two grams of gemcitabine in the bladder, I cap the catheter for an hour, and then we uncap the catheter and the patient goes home uh, without their catheter. And I think it's a really easy, effective tool to prevent recurrence. All right, so one of the key uh, messages is we don't do as good a job as we think we do when we ablate tumors in the upper tract, okay? And the guideline statement specifically says, irrespective of how you do this, retrograde or anagrade, you should look back up in the upper tract within three months. So what's the data behind it? So Olivier Traxer, who's in France, is probably one of the best endourologists in the world with regards to techniques and skill. And he published a paper a few years ago that looked at his own series and patients who had upper tract ablation. And then when they looked back into those same kidneys eight weeks later, 50% of those patients still had an upper tract tumor and almost 90% of them were in the same location. What it basically means is probably it didn't recur. It was probably tumor persistence. They didn't get down to the base. Maybe they didn't blade everything. Maybe the visualization became difficult. So I do think it's critical that when you go on this path of endoscopic treatment, you really need to look back in in three months to ensure that the quality of the work you did was effective. How many use chemoablation in their practice? Anybody use gel mito? Okay, so uh, for those that don't, um, I'll introduce the concept and I'll sort of highlight what I think is the key role for it, okay? So the whole concept of gel mito is the, the whole issue with how do you get drug to stay in the upper tract? And so this is a proprietary uh, drug um, that basically looks at a gel that's complex with mitomycin. The gel is cold, uh, uh, sorry, it's liquid at a cold temperature. And then when it gets to body temperature, it becomes more gelatinous. So think the opposite of jello, right? It's the exact opposite of how jello works. The whole idea is when you put it into the upper tract and it becomes gelatinous, the contact time with the mucosa goes up. So these can actually ablate tumors. This is probably the one key study that has uh, really helped with the FDA approval. So this is the FDA approved treatment in the US. And the important thing is that 
The FDA approved indication for gel mito is chemo ablation. You have a tumor in the upper tract, you're giving it to ablate the tumor. It's not FDA approved after you're done lasering to put this drug up into there, okay? That's an off-label indication. The FDA approved is chemo ablation. In my practice, where do I think this technology applies? Look, so I, I'm a urologist, I'm a surgeon. I like to see things and I like to, if I can, I like to endoscopically ablate them because visually I feel like that's satisfying. And, and I feel like I can confirm that I've ablated the tumor. This is where I think the chemo ablation helps, okay? Number one, folks that have multifocal tumors, but more importantly, this bottom box here. There are cases where maybe in lower pole tumor, you can see the tumor, you can biopsy the tumor, and you can only laser about half the tumor because your scopes don't articulate enough. So these tumors that are unreachable by laser, I think those are, as long as they're biopsy proven low grade, I think they are actually pretty good candidates if appropriate for kidney preservation. How well does it work? So this was the trial that we did. If you look about three months after installation and it's weekly installations for six weeks, the response rate's about 60%. Okay, 60% had their tumors ablated, and of those that had a successful ablation, 80% of those were durable at 12 months. So those are the sort of the numbers that I counsel patients, which is 60% will respond, and four out of five of you will have a durable response if you, res uh, if you were a responder at 12 months. It's not without the potential for side effects. And I think the big one is really the potential that the drug and the instrumentation of the upper tract can contribute to ureteral stenosis or strictures. I tend to give it every other week and, and I have sort of have my own algorithm uh, it, to try to minimize the likelihood of that occurring when I do use this. And I'm happy to chat at the end of the course on you know different, different algorithms, none of which are purely evidence-based. They're much more anecdotal, frankly, on avoiding this. I just wanna present a second case, which is really looking at somebody with left upper tract cancer. But now we're gonna go to that sort of um, indications for endoscopic management, which are in those rare select cases. So a patient with a solitary kidney, they had right upper tract cancer, had a nephroidorectomy, had bladder cancer, had a cystoprostatectomy. Now they have intermittent gross hematuria. CKD stage four, GFR of 22, but pretty good functional status otherwise. Non-contrast CT scan showing this hyperdense area in the upper pole of the left solitary kidney. Clear filling defect that you can see on a pilogram that was done via the conduit. Bulky upper pole filling defect. Percutaneous biopsy, high grade, okay? Staging evaluation negative. Patient does not want to be on dialysis. Refuses nephroid redirectomy. And we had a multidisciplinary tumor board going through, do we have to do anything? Dr. Trong mentioned there are cases you don't have to do anything. Patient was bleeding, however, so that wasn't a good option. Discussion with our medical oncology colleagues regarding systemic therapy, patient's GFR is 22, risk of worse bleeding if they become pancytopenic potentially, or thrombocytopenic on chemotherapy. So the decision was to go and treat the tumor. And again, this now falls into that red box, okay? This is the rare select cases where endoscopic treatment, ablative therapies may be useful, but certainly not routine standard of care. And it can be done either retrograde, but in this case, I'm gonna show you some brief stuff, which is percutaneous. So percutaneously accessing that calyx, placing a wire down to the conduit, and in our practice, my partner, John Knadler, does a lot of these surgeries. So visualizing the tumor within the upper pole, um, then doing a good endoscopy of the remaining portions of the kidney to ensure that there is no other sites of disease or at least mapping out the focality. And then what he tends to use um, is a loop resectoscope, very similar to how you loop resectoscope uh, tumors in the bladder. But the important thing to be cognizant of is that the kidney is far less forgiving than the bladder. So you can resect pretty deep in the bladder, even well into the muscle, and, and put a catheter at the end of the case and it'll be fine. And you can't really do that so much because if you resect deep on a uh, kidney, you're gonna hit some of the arcuate vessels and you have the potential for much more significant bleeding. And so one of the tools that he's evolved to is in addition to using the loop, sometimes using the bipolar button because the button and a vaporization setting sometimes is more controlled than the loop itself. Remember, even if you have a patient that you have this high grade tumor on in the upper tract, however you manage it, if you manage it endoscopically, you really should consider 
giving BCG into the upper tract. It's high-grade tumor, just like high-grade bladder cancer. If you don't, they're likely to recur. And the two situations for BCG installation in the upper tract is these high-grade or high-risk favorable upper tract tumors that you manage or upper tract carcinoma in situ. I'm gonna finish in the last two minutes to highlight you have to be vigilant with these patients. Recurrences occur. This is a really nice a pooled analysis or sort of a summary of the literature is really what it is from Firas Petros. And these are the numbers that I quote patients. At about three to five years, upper tract recurrence rate within the first three to five years, 65%, two thirds. Bladder recurrence rate's about 40 to 50%. They have to be on and they have to be compliant with regimens. And the follow up regimens are predicated on risk stratification and kidney sparing versus extirpation. This is a slide and you know, th this is all in the guideline, but the way I would distill most of this down for you is that a few key points. Number one, we talk about five years of follow-up. Number two, looking up into the upper tract provided they have not recurred, okay? This is a scenario where somebody hasn't recurred. So if they recur, the whole clock starts all over again. But if they haven't recurred, you only really need to look up into the upper tract for the first year. And after that, you could rely on imaging studies provided you can get contrasted imaging studies for the remainder. Cystoscopy and cytology are critical, and if you have a kidney sparing high risk patient, you should be getting chest imaging for five years. Always remember, don't be, remain married to your technology. So if ablation is not working or the patients recur or progress, this is a nice schematic that shows even if you start them on a path of endoscopic management, you have to be willing to to pivot to more um, aggressive treatment if their disease, grade, stage, or focality progresses. So my conclusions are, think about endoscopic ablation, think about that as a tool. We should be using it more for low risk upper tract disease. There's no perfect recipe, use whatever is available to you, modify your technique. As you can see, you can use all kinds of settings to accomplish your goal. Have to counsel patients that recurrences can occur and they need to be compliant. And the surveillance regimens are really critical in that regard to make sure you don't miss progression in these patients. Thank you. Uh, so a quick question on the chat. Uh, one came up is, uh, can you address the risk of perinephric seeding, percutaneous tract seeding, uh, using anti-grade resection? Uh, and would that seem, be, seem to be an issue in high risk? So how do you, how do you deal with that, Jay? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a great question. And, and I think, um, I don't think there's any clear, so the question that was asked is really the, the risk of tract seeding if you approach these percutaneously. And, and I think certainly when we did the systematic review for the guidelines, that there's no clear evidence that a percutaneous approach puts you at higher risk for tract seeding. There's some really good data um, out of uh, Nortra LIJ, Arthur Smith's group, that really has probably one of the most extensive experiences because he was doing this early. And they have not reported higher risk of tract seeding, and they've even tried other strategies such as ablating the tract at the end using RF energy or cryo. And, and some of those sort of nuances didn't seem to really make a difference uh, in their recurrence rates. I, I don't know, Jonathan, if you... you know, I was going to say, I think a key is, is also just having through and through access down to the bladder because you want all this stuff to kind of wash its way down away from you. So catheter in the bladder, <laughs> You know, if you need to even, you know, uh, put a stent. I've seen some people even put real access sheaths from below to help, you know, get stuff to flow down. But mostly it's the flow of the water down and into the bladder, so it really shouldn't come back out at the end of the case And if you get a good resection. Obviously, also trying to make sure that your uh, tube, I think, stays in place and doesn't back out so that that way you're not, you know, accidentally pulling out and then having water circle around the kidney. So just very careful technique may help. Sorry, Gene. No, no problem. Thank you. Good morning to the people here in the room and also online. My name is Jeannie Huffman Sensitz. I'm a genital urinary medical oncologist with specialty in urothelial cancer, bladder, and upper tract disease, and I practice at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And I'm going to focus on neoadjuvant and adjuvant systemic therapy for high grade localized upper tract urothelial cancer. So in this talk, we'll review the criteria for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant immunotherapy, and talk a little bit about trials in progress. And I'll hi highlight a case, but to um, give you a little preview, this uh, case really exemplifies, I think, some of the missed opportunities that we had to take care of this patient. So this is a 72-year-old female who presented with gross hematuria to her urologist, and imaging demonstrated an obstructive two centimeter left ureteral mass she had a creatinine of 1.0, but being 71 years old and a tiny lady, her clearance was about 70. 
Her bladder was without tumor on inspection and a visualized ureteral tumor was biopsied at the time of uh, an initial um, evaluation. She had a high grade upper tract urethelial cancer. So for our first guideline statement on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, clinicians should offer cisplatin-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy to patients undergoing a nephro-ureterectomy or ureterectomy with high-risk upper tract urethelial cancer. And that's particularly for those patients where post-operative GFR is expected to be less than 60 mils per minute, or those with other medical comorbidities that would preclude platinum-based chemotherapy in the post-operative setting. So when we think about cisplatin eligibility for patients with um, urethelial cancer, these are the five kind of criteria. These are the Galski criteria that have been published several years ago. We first of all think about their performance status. You know, are they working full time or did they come in in a wheelchair? Do they have peripheral neuropathy? Because cisplatin can really exacerbate or cause peripheral neuropathy. We worry that, about that particularly for patients who may fall because they have neuropathy. Uh, do patients have hearing loss? Uh, that can also be worsened uh, with cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Um, what's their cardiovascular status? So with cisplatin chemotherapy, because it's nephrotoxic, uh, we give lots of IV fluids, a liter before, a liter after cisplatin all in one day, and in addition, run that uh, platinum in another liter of fluid. So it's quite a lot of fluid. And then, of course, we think about the renal function. So when I counsel patients about perioperative chemotherapy with upper tract disease, I tell them that I'm you know, considering giving them a drug that's both metabolized by their kidneys and potentially toxic to their kidneys. Um, so it can be a little bit of a challenging conversation, but especially in this population of patients. So when we think about their renal function, um, as a medical oncologist especially, um, a lot of our patients um, do have impaired kidney function with um, upper tract urethelial cancer. There are some modifiable things that we can think about in the office, looking at some of the medications that patients are on. If patients are on NSAIDs, we of course want to get them off of those. Some blood pressure medications can impact kidney function. And then I think we also have to remember that patients with urethelial cancer, they do tend to auto dehydrate themselves. And when we give them a challenge of IV fluid, sometimes their kidney function can actually get a lot better in the setting of chemo therapy. So when we see those um, renal functions improve, sometimes that, that can help. And then of course, finally, some of our patients do have obstructive disease at the time of presentation that may or may not be able to be um, impacted with a stent. As Dr. Ramon also stated that the post-op um, renal function really can decline precluding cisplatin in the adjuvant setting. So often we really have one shot on goal to give patients uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy with high-risk upper tract urethelial cancer. In a general population of patients with high-risk urethelial cancer that walk into our office, it's about 50% that are even candidates to get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That's both for bladder cancer and upper tract disease. And that number declines significantly in patients that have a nephrourethectomy, where um, the risk of uh, uh, renal function decline post-op is pretty significant. And that's been shown on multiple studies. So there is some retrospective, lots of retrospective data, in fact, um, supporting the use of uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, as well as two kind of dedicated uh, prospective studies. So the first was looking at uh, accelerated MVAC that led to a pathologic complete response rate of 14% in a small population of patients. And then a recently published study by Dr. Coleman here and colleagues uh, that showed a pathologic complete response rate of 19% using this um, rather somewhat novel split dose chemotherapy, a cisplatin and gemcitabine, in which patients receive, instead of a full 70 milligrams per meter squared on day one, which is traditional cisplatin dosing for cisplatin and gemcitabine, it's instead 35 milligrams per meter squared on day one and day eight with the same dose of cisplatin, but also importantly, the same supportive uh, care with lots of IV fluids um, in that regimen. And here are the Kaplan-Meier curves for that study, which nicely show that in patients um, in green who had a complete response or in red with a partial response had improved PFS as well as overall survival following uh, that neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, versus those that um, did not have a response in blue. Um, so uh, very nicely exemplifying some of the uh, potential benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy.
Also want to highlight an ongoing prospective randomized phase three study. Uh, this is ECOG-ACRIN 8192, an intergroup study that's open throughout the US. Uh, this study is enrolling patients with high grade upper tract urothelial cancer who are destined for nephroureterectomy. The main part of the study really is this phase three portion here where patients with an adequate creatinine clearance are randomized to receive either four cycles of neoadjuvant accelerated MVAC or accelerated MVAC plus Dervalumab. All those patients will go on to a NFU uh, and then follow up with a primary endpoint evaluating event-free survival in that cohort. There's also a non-comparative arm down here for a cisplatin ineligible cohort. This is a smaller group. Uh, and for those patients, they receive gemcitabine plus Dervalumab for four cycles and move on to surgery. Again, that non-comparative arm is looking at a primary endpoint of PATH-CR at the time of NEPHEW. So our clinical case continues. This patient was actually not referred to medical oncology prior to surgery. Uh, she did have a nephroureterectomy, and the, uh, she had a high-risk tumor. She had a pathologic T3 tumor, but NX. There were no lymph nodes taken at the time of surgery. Um, she had scans about six weeks post-surgery, and there was no evidence of uh, metastatic disease. But at that point in time, her creatinine clearance was 40 mils per minute and not eligible for cisplatin. She came to see me as a new patient in medical oncology clinic for this high-risk upper tract tumor to discuss adjuvant therapy. And here's our second guideline statement in the uh, advanced setting. Uh, for systemic uh, therapy. Clinicians should offer platinum-based adjuvant chemotherapy to patients with advanced pathologic stage upper tract urothelial cancers, so that's T2 to T4 or lymph node positive disease, after an FU or ureterectomy who have not received neoadjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy. And this is very strong evidence. And here we highlight on the same slide uh, the PALT trial. So let's talk about the PALT trial. So this was a randomized phase three study that was done in Europe. Um, all patients in this trial went straight to nephroureterectomy. They did not have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And they selected these high-risk patients who had T2 to T4 or lymph node positive disease um, within 90 days following surgery. They were randomized one-to-one. -one. Uh, patients went on to either active surveillance or received chemotherapy with four cycles of either cisplatin and gemcitabine, which was preferred, or carboplatin and gemcitabine, and patients received that chemotherapy based on their renal function, and then went on to a standard follow-up. So this was a positive study. Patients who had chemotherapy in the red versus those that underwent surveillance in the blue had improved disease-free survival as well as metastasis-free survival. On the final analysis, uh, there was an improvement, numerical improvement in overall survival um, with chemotherapy versus surveillance alone, but this did not meet uh, st a strict statistical uh, requirements for, for, for uh, being a positive study. So one of the, uh, this is a subgroup analysis from this study, it gets a lot of attention. So as you can see, the patients that uh, received cisplatin and gemcitabine versus those that received carboplatin and gemcitabine, looks like that was favoring uh, chemotherapy. Now this study was not designed to tell the difference between cisplatin and gemcitabine and carboplatin and gemcitabine, but of interest, quite a few patients needed to switch midstream from cisplatin, what they started, uh, to carboplatin uh, later in the study. And this is something that we know, so probably a, a, a little bit of an unfair comparison, but if you look at the two prospective clinical trials, the 8141 study as well as Dr. Coleman's study, and the number of, or percentage of patients that was able to complete three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that was really pretty high versus those that were able to complete at least three cycles of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the PALT trial. So we know um, that starting out maybe with a creatinine clearance of 60 doesn't always um, mean that you end, that, uh, end at that same reasonable creatinine clearance to get platinum-based chemotherapy. And I think really just more of those patients were found in the post-op setting. So this case continues. Um, 
when I met the patient in medical oncology clinic, we discussed adjuvant therapy. Based on her creatinine clearance and her tumor, I was quite worried about her, but really did not have the opportunity to make a choice here. And um, we discussed, and she received four cycles of adjuvant carboplatin and gentidine chemotherapy. So following the four cycles of chemotherapy, her imaging showed an enhancing soft tissue density measuring about one and a half centimeters at the surgical bed, and this was abutting the psoas muscle. But there was no other evidence of, me of measurable disease on this imaging. So for another guideline statement here, for patients with high-risk upper tract urothelial cancer, clinicians should perform a lymph node dissection at the time of nephroureterectomy or ureterectomy, and this is a strong recommendation. So without ev any evidence of other uh, measurable disease and the lack of upfront lymph node dissection and the fact that she had isolated disease, this was a joint decision for surgery. And this was in fact one of the questions that the patient had at the time of her initial evaluation with me, which was kind of recognizing that she did not have a lymph node dissection. Should she move forward with chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting or have a lymph node dissection? So when this isolated recurrence was found after chemotherapy. I think both the patient and our team were, were quite interested in considering if there was a way to consolidate her with surgery. So she did go on to have that lymph node dissection and surprising, I think, to us all that she had metastatic cancer in 10 out of 52 lymph nodes. And that was really not at all evident on imaging. Um, and I think really also exemplifies the fact that our clinical imaging with CT and, and, and other modalities really uh, un does, does not uh, correctly uh, demonstrate really how much disease might be there. And I think just further um, uh, influences, I think, our recommendation uh, for lymph node dissection for these patients with very, very high risk tumors. Imaging post six weeks post lymph node dissection, she had no evidence of measurable disease. And that brings us to another guideline statement about adjuvant immunotherapy. So adjuvant nivolumab therapy may be offered to patients who received neoadjuvant platinum-based chemotherapy, either YPT2, meaning they had neoadjuvant chemotherapy to T4, or who are ineligible or refused perioperative cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And for those patients, the stage um, uh, to meet criteria for adjuvant nivolumab is higher at T3. And that's based on this study. This is the Checkmate 274 study. So in this uh, study, uh, the, this study enrolled patients with high-risk urothelial cancer, either uh, bladder cancer or upper tract urothelial cancer. These patients had to have an R0 resection and be randomized uh, less than 120 days before, random, uh, be, uh, since the time of surgery. All of the patients in this study had a post-surgery uh, CT scan and there was no evidence of metastatic disease. Patients were randomized either to receive uh, nivolumab every two weeks for a year of therapy or uh, placebo. And again, the uh, inclusion criteria based on the um, receipt or not of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So what does this study tell us about patients that have upper tract urothelial cancer? In terms of the uh, inclusion criteria and the number of patients that had upper tract disease, it was about 20% of the entire population that had upper tract urothelial cancer. Less than half of the patients in the study had preoperative cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Close to 50% had uh, positive lymph nodes on the, uh, on the study. And I think interestingly too, when you look at the number of patients that were either um, N0, NX with less than 10 lymph nodes removed, that was a little bit over 25%. So I think most of us for bladder and upper tract disease would consider that an inadequate lymph node dissection. This was a positive study. So in the intent to treat population, meaning all patients bladder and upper tract disease um, that had adjuvant nivolumab versus uh, placebo led to a disease-free survival benefit that was statistically significant at a year. And this finding was even more pronounced in the patients that had pdl one positive tumors. There's a lot of uh, kind of press and discussion about this subgroup analysis. And again, what does this study tell us about patients that have upper tract urothelial cancer? 
So who did well on this study and who may, uh, may have potentially not gotten the same uh, benefit? Again, with the notion that everything in this subgroup analysis, I think, is just hypothesis generating. So people who were treated in the United States versus in Europe, people who had a baseline creatinine clearance that was over 60, uh, patients who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and patients with bladder cancer tended to do better. And when we think about that, those subgroup uh, analysis consideration, in addition to those patients with a lymph node dissection that was inadequate here, um, potentially not getting a benefit, I have to wonder to myself, did patients with upper tract urothelial cancer not fare as well on the study because they also had an inadequate lymph node dissection, started with a poor creatinine clearance, and didn't have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and may have been uh, treated in countries where they were uh, maybe not even offered that in the preoperative setting. Again, this is a hypothesis generating uh, subgroup analysis, and this was a positive study overall. There was an update of this study presented at GU ASCO this year uh, for a longer term follow up continuing to show a very impressive disease-free survival benefit with adjuvant nivolumab versus placebo in both the intent to treat and the pdl one positive tumors. And this included distant metastasis-free survival, also a very important outcome. And interestingly also, the receipt of adjuvant nivolumab also improved a second progression-free survival. So now in the treatment of advanced and metastatic urothelial cancer, we have very effective agents in the second, third, fourth line setting with sasituzumab, govotecan, and fertumab, verdotin, erdofitinib, with response rates above 40 to 50% with those drugs. So in patients who live long enough to receive those, um, they, they can do better. Uh, so there's a secondary gain, we believe, so from the receipt of adjuvant and volumab. There was another study that's been reported, adjuvant atezolizumab versus observation, so a slightly different design. In muscle invasive urothelial cancer, this was the Invigor trial. Now this was a negative trial, again in the post-operative setting. There were fewer patients with upper tract urothelial cancer in this population. But of interest, and this was a, a secondary publication that came uh, from that paper published in Nature, Patients in the post-operative setting who had positive circulating tumor DNA and received adjuvant atezolizumab had an improved disease-free survival compared to those uh, who received observation. So this was um, a very interesting kind of secondary analysis from that study and uh, was the basis of a currently ongoing study. This is the Invigor 111 study looking at adjuvant atezolizumab versus placebo for high-risk muscle invasive bladder cancer post cystectomy. And again, this is only for patients that have positive circulating tumor DNA. So of these uh, several studies that are either uh, reported or maturing, we've now treated over 2,700 patients in phase three adjuvant studies with high-risk urothelial cancer. And I still think there's a lot of unanswered questions for those patients with high-risk upper tract urothelial cancer. I mentioned this Invigor study ongoing for patients with high-risk bladder cancer with positive circulating tumor DNA after surgery. And this is the modern study, slightly different design, but kind of same idea. Patients with high-risk bladder cancer, circulating tumor DNA positive patients. Um, this study will be uh, activating soon through one of the intergroups. Um, but unfortunately, neither of these studies are enrolling patients with upper tract disease. So our case continues. The patient, um, as you recall, underwent a lymph node dissection with quite a lot of positive lymph nodes. Imaging six weeks post that lymph node dissection was no evidence of metastatic disease. And kind of in extrapolating a bit from the adjuvant uh, data as well as the fact that she had um, metastatic disease in lymph node that was removed, uh, she received checkpoint inhibitor in kind of the adjuvant first line setting for three cycles, and then we did repeat staging. Unfortunately, after three cycles of therapy, she had ongoing progression with new lymph nodes as well as disease emerging in the liver, which is a very poor prognostic sign for patients with urothelial cancer, and we moved on to enfertumab in the third line. 
So in summary, for this case of a 72-year-old female who presented with gross hematuria with imaging demonstrating an obstructive left ureter mass with a creatinine clearance that was good enough to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, um, who was biopsied and had high-grade upper tract urothelial cancer, I think this uh, exemplifies some missed opportunities. So she up went in upfront nephroureterectomy without discussion of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In fact, um, she did not uh, see a medical oncologist for that discussion prior to surgery. Her surgery was without an adequate lymph node dissection, so we had incomplete staging information, and, as well as uh, likely incomplete treatment of, uh, of that lesion. She had a very high risk post-operative stage of tumor, pathologic T3 tumor, and again, without a lymph node dissection, so we had incomplete information. Like we see with many patients, her post-operative creatinine clearance did not support cisplatin-based chemotherapy, so she received carboplatin, again, supported by the randomized phase three PALT trial, but may not be as adequate. Her lymph node dissection demonstrated a really significant disease burden that was not radiographically evident, and that may have been the case when she initially presented as well. Immunotherapy, post-chemotherapy in the perioperative setting, I think is a reasonable thing to discuss with patients, but those with upper tract urothelial cancer, I think that there's a lot of unanswered questions. Despite the hypothesis generating data that comes from the subgroup analysis of the uh, adjuvant nivolumab study, we know that urothelial cancer, whether or not it's bladder or upper tract, does respond to immunotherapy in the metastatic setting. So at least for my patients, I do have that conversation with them if they have high-risk tumor after chemotherapy. Thank you. Thanks. That was a, um, I think that was a great example of how things can go off the rails, you know, uh, when you're not sort of following a standardized approach. And, you know, there's, as you said, missed opportunities where uh, this patient could have had a much better outcome potentially uh, if they had sort of undergone a more standard uh, regimen. Uh, please, question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Just a question to the panel. If you have a clinically node negative um, upper tract. Um, I don't know, the, I should probably read the guidelines, but are you obligated to do a diagnostic um, RPLND on those patients? So if your CT scan is negative uh, pre-op, are you, should you do um, RPLND? Just uh, question. Great question, lead right into my talk. So, uh, but the answer <laughs> is, uh, the answer is yes. Um, so it depends on, uh, to some degree, on the, the grade of their cancer and their, their risk categorization. Uh, and I'll go through that in just a minute. Sorry, another question? In a patient who is uh, a bad candidate for surgery and a bad candidate for um, neoadjuvant chemo, would you consider immunotherapy? Gee. So I, I think that there are a minority of patients that may not um, be great candidates for surgery or endoscopic management. And maybe like the patient that Dr. Rahman, you know, was talking about at the end, who completely refuse any kind of surgery. And I think for those patients, we can have a discussion that they are unresectable. And then in that case, we may consider systemic therapy. But I think that's that's not that's not something that we do so often, and and definitely with a lot of counseling in clinic. Would you consider that once nodes are visible, or would you just proceed? I mean, once nodes are visible, that patient has metastatic urothelial cancer, and particularly if, if they're high risk for surgery, then I would consider them that they're best treated with upfront systemic therapy. So if it's someone with metastatic urothelial cancer who is not a candidate for chemotherapy, um, that's, again, a, a, a rarer population, but then I would give frontline immunotherapy. Um, if they're not a candidate for um, cisplatin-based chemotherapy, there was a recent FDA approval of the combination of enfortumab plus pembrolizumab in the metastatic setting. It's actually one of the guideline statements that I don't think we cover in the talk, but is there is that um, for patients who have metastatic, so first of all, the guideline is, is focused on patients with localized disease, non-metastatic disease, but there are certain some, we, we sort of had to ride close to that line in some cases for, for cases like what should you do for a patient who comes to you with node positive metastatic, essentially metastatic disease up front. There really is no role for cytoreductive nephrectomy or nephrectomy for a patient who has established metastatic cancer. So if a patient has, you know, um, obvious nodal 
nodal disease. Um, it's you know, even PET positive or biopsy positive nodal metastases. There is no role really for surgery in that patient. That patient should receive chemotherapy. That's a metastatic disease patient. Um, so so the, you know, that's, a, that's a guideline statement this year. Yes? <laughs> yeah, so we should have had you on the guideline panel. So to repeat the question, it was what, what do you do for patients who respond to chemotherapy, who have metastatic disease, respond to chemotherapy, and is there a role for surgery in that case? And in fact, we did address that. So we would call that consolidative surgery. So that's for patients who, res who receive chemotherapy, have shown response. Um, and then there's a role for chemo or surgery afterwards, yes. So for consolidative surgery, there is a role in select patients. Um, typically, that role is a little stronger in patients who show complete response where everything is melted away. Uh, but even in patients who have you know, potentially very strong partial responses, uh, there may be a role. So there is a guideline statement surrounding that in the, in the guideline. Yeah, it's a good question, and it comes up quite a lot. Um, yeah, and as I said, that's how we had to skate, you know, around that line of, you know, it's a, it's a localized, you know, uh, guideline for localized upper tract, but, but that's certainly a patient who had metastases, but now is considered, you know, uh, sort of responding and, and, and now has localized, presumed localized disease in that setting. So I'm going to go through a couple of cases <clears throat> to talk about the surgical options that we manage uh, for patients in upper tract. I'm going to try not to go over time here, so I'm going to try and scoot through this pretty quickly. And here's a case, a uh, 68-year-old man, a uh, former smoker. Uh, he has multifocal low-grade cancer uh, in the right kidney. Uh, you've, uh, this is his CT scan below, so you can clearly see that there's filling defect in the upper tract. You can see that the, ki the kidney shows a little bit of delayed um, uh, nephrogram on that side, so there's some hydronephrosis. Um, and uh, he's, you've checked about his family history, no family history. His GFR is fairly poor. It's only 44. This is not a patient who you normally would consider chemotherapy for. But he's got a right filling defect on the right side. He's got some hydronephrosis, but when you look in the ureter, you see this sort of nodular pattern. We talked about, um, you know, what does this mean when you have this sort of sessile versus papillary architecture? You know, this is sort of considered um, sort of polypoid uh, appearance of, of these masses and often associated with low-grade cancer. So uh, this is what you saw. This is what you biopsied. It came back as low-grade. You looked up inside the kidney and you saw something maybe a little bit more ominous looking. And when you did a selective cytology in this patient, that selective cytology came back as high grade uh, on, the, uh, on the cytology. Um, you also ended up getting a, uh, a CT of the chest. Uh, his chest was clear and his nodes uh, were negative on the, uh, on the CT scan. So uh, essentially low grade biopsy, high grade cytology, um, and a mixed uh, appearance uh, graphically. So, so what would be the next move for this patient? Um, so you say, well, this, this looks pretty addressable. Maybe I could you know, handle this. Would anyone here try and attempt this endoscopic treatment? So not a, you did your diagnostic ureteroscopy. Now you have your answer that you have low-grade cancer, high-grade cytology, but would anyone take on this case of multifocal low-grade cancer with an, an endoscope and try and laser it? Any show of hands? Some people, all right. Um, how about gel mito, you know, low-grade indication? Gel mito for this guy? Oh, so um, not many takers on that one. Uh, is his imaging okay? Do we have to do more? Uh, should he get a PET scan? Would someone say, well, I'm kind of worried about this guy. High-grade cytology, something going on. Hydronephrosis, maybe a little more high risk. Uh, should I get a PET scan to see what's going on? Do I trust the, uh, the CT scan? Anyone get a PET scan on this patient? Got one taker, okay. Um, and uh, what about neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Someone says, I don't trust any of this. I'm going to send it for neoadjuvant chemo. Uh, even though their GFR is poor, I'm pretty sure I can talk my medical oncologist into you know, hydrating them and, and getting them up to speed, and we should be okay. Anyone give them neoadjuvant chemo next? For low grade, maybe. Okay, all right. Uh, other steps. Would anyone else do anything more? Do you want to know more for this guy? All right. What other steps? What else do you want to do? Somebody give me an answer. Repeat the biopsy in the kidney, that's one choice, sure. Go up in the kidney and re-biopsy him, see if you can get something there. Go ahead. His, his, his bladder was fine, his bladder was clear. Yep. Nuclear scan. Nuclear scan, Nuclear scan for, a, for a PET scan, you talking about? Kidney function. For kidney function, excellent, okay, good idea. I like that one. Um, so a couple things, just the guideline statements. 
What's the role of washing? Washing is really important. It adds more information to what we know about our patients, helps us risk stratify. We know that opportunistic biopsies in the upper tract are going for the lowest hanging fruit, the stuff you can grab. Some of the other stuff that you see there, like that, that tumor up in the renal pelvis to try and biopsy, I like the idea of biopsying it. Sometimes you should go and biopsy that. If you say, look, this stuff in the ureter looks like it's low grade, but that looks different. If you can try and get a sample from there, that might help you. But most people would kind of go after that ureteral stuff. And then, um, based on that finding, you would risk stratify your patients. Here's the risk stratification table. You've seen this already before. Um, let's go through this case. So uh, this guy does not fall into the, he falls low risk because of the low grade. However, his cytology takes him out of the low, low risk category and puts him over here. So this is where people kind of get confused. How do I use this table? So on and so forth. Um, you can't have high grade cytology and be in the low risk category. So you're automatically now shifted over here. Favorable could be any cytology. You could have high grade cytology and fall into this category, but he has high grade cytology and he has obstruction. He has multifocality. He has what appears to be flat tumor in the upper tract. So he clearly falls into the high risk unfavorable category based on those features. And so this is a, a change in category, and we would not recommend endoscopic management in this case. So let's go back. So endoscopic management, no. Gel mito, it's not labeled for high-grade disease, okay? Gel mito is labeled for low-grade disease. I know people were talking about, you know, using this off-label in different circumstances, but it is not labeled in that way and should not be used for high-grade. In fact, the patients who I've had who failed gel mito therapy for low-grade cancers, because I biopsied, it came back low-grade, I used gel mito, six courses, everything went through the whole process. Process. Those patients who failed, I found residual high-grade disease in their kidneys afterwards. So it doesn't work for high-grade cancer and really shouldn't be used in that indication. Uh, imaging, uh, is it okay? Yes. Uh, I don't really get PET scans in these patients uh, unless there's something suspicious. If there's a node that's positive, and again, you can have shoddy or inflammatory lymph nodes, and maybe it's questionable as to what's there, but um, for a patient who has completely normal nodes, has this picture of what we saw on this scan, um, I don't see the indication for a PET scan there. And I don't know, if Jeannie, would you ever get a PET scan in a patient like this, or, or not really? Not, not unless you had some suspicion. Okay. Um, and then neoadjuvant chemotherapy, this patient's not cisplatin ineligible, so you could try carbo. You might say, well, I'm gonna, I want to take his kidney out because I'm concerned about it. I'm, I, I'm feeling like I'm going down the road of a nephro-U for this patient, but could you give him neoadjuvant gemcitabine cisplatinum? He's not cisplatinum eligible, so, um, so how do we work around that issue? And then as far as other alternative neoadjuvant options, could you give him carbo? Maybe put him on a trial, potentially. We talked about some alternatives that could be used in terms of uh, you know, maybe you know, Pembro in this setting for some uh, certain indications for the unresectable case, but he's a resectable patient. Um, and other steps, um, MMR testing. Yeah, so uh, MMR testing for him uh, should be done. His MMR testing uh, came back negative. Um, his renal function and the question of a stent, I think came up before, getting a, getting a renal scan, so good idea. So um, essentially, uh, that's what we did. His MMR testing was negative. Uh, his renal scan came back with moderate obstruction on that side, uh, right more than left. Um, and so we did, we put a stent in and guess what? His GFR came up to 64. Wow, big win. Okay, so now what? So now the door opens up so we can talk about uh, giving this patient something uh, like a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Optionally, if he had like say a conduit, you could put a perk tube in this guy. If he has a conduit, you don't wanna go through his conduit and you could decompress his kidney that way and then see if his GFR improves. Hydrate him, you know, get them up to speed. A lot of guys with conduits will be dehydrated because of insensible losses. So hydration uh, after putting in a, a neft tube uh, makes a lot of sense and you'll see these GFRs improve and now suddenly they become eligible for chemotherapy. So he received split dose gemcitabine cisplatinum. And now he comes back to you. He's completed his course of therapy. Everything is good. He's, getting, he's now coming to you for surgery. And he says, okay, what surgical options? So what can I, what can I do next? So um, robot versus open. Um, who would uh, recommend uh, only open surgery for patients for nephroutorectomy as the option? Um, how about uh, robotic? Anyone here offer robotic surgery? So robotic nephro-u, okay. Um, node dissection. Should he or should he not have a node dissection? Node dissection, yes. No dissection, no. All right, we convinced them. Good, Jeannie's a great talker. She, she got you guys convinced. So um, if so, what extent? So he has tumor in the proximal ureter, just like the test question we had before, and in the kidney, um, nothing in the mid or lower ureter. So what should be the extent? Handling of the ureter. Does anyone here do early clipping of the ureter? So you get in, you start right away, you clip the ureter before you do anything else? 
that's a new thing. You know, people, we, I didn't train that way. Uh, when I did open surgery, it was all just, you know, do the net for you. But now people are doing early clipping, early securing of the distal ureter. Um, and uh, that's a, a pathway that many of us have embraced with the feeling that that can reduce uh, bladder seeding. Uh, ureterectomy approach, um, would you do a bladder cuff? Anyone do a formal bladder cuff or do you just kind of go down and take it off the side of the ear? Who would do a formal bladder cuff? Great, everybody. Anyone just kind of take it off by the ureter, just go down as low as you can and cut it and take it there? Um, and uh, does anyone uh, do that? Trans Who does transvesical distal uterectomy? Good. And anyone do extravesical from the outside? Yeah, a mixture of approaches. So those are all uh, options. And who would give intravesical mitomycin after nephro-U for these patients? Yeah, a lot of people do. So that's, uh, we'll go over that in just a moment. So we asked about, you asked about node dissection. Should the patient get a node dissection? Well, for patients who fall in the low risk category, so that guy I talked about before, if he was really low risk, if his biopsy was low grade, if all that stuff we saw was low grade, his cytology was negative, he had hydronephrosis, he fell into that low risk, unfavorable group where you're like, look, I, you know, I've got one, one of my colleagues back here who's brave, he's gonna, he's gonna take that on with an endoscope. Most people are thinking multifocal disease, I'm not skilled enough to really do all of that with an endoscope and take care of all that cancer even though it's low grade. Uh, I'm not convinced that gel mito is going to be good for this guy. He's got hydro. You know, how am I going to put gel mito in a guy with hydro who may, it might not come out? I have to put a stent in and all this stuff. So I'm going to take him for a nephrourectomy. Should he get a node dissection? Well, for low grade or low risk disease, if they're in that category, it's optional. You may do it if you, if you choose to. Um, and that's a conditional recommendation. There is strong evidence, however, for the high-risk patient. So anyone who falls into the high-risk category, they should get a node dissection. These are the templates of, of dissection that have been described in the literature. The intraocaval nodes are sort of optional, I would say. The, there, are no, there are nodes, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna get the uh, perihylar periortics for the left side, the, uh, the paracavals and retrocavals on the right side, you're gonna get 82%, 83, 85% of all the nodes that you're gonna find, they're gonna be positive. You'll miss a small number of nodes by not doing the interator cables. So, so the guidelines basically said stick to the great vessel on either side and the interator cables will be optional. This is what we recommend for the renal pelvis tumor. So if you're in the renal pelvis, it should be from the hilum down to essentially the, uh, the IMA, the level of the IMA. So periaortic uh, on the right side, uh, you know, retroaortic, you know, preaortic, I'm sorry, on the left side should be preaortic, retroaortic, and periaortic. On the right side, it should be precaval, uh, paracaval, and retrocaval. The intraortic caval nodes would be optional, um, down to the IMA. For the proximal ureter, you should go all the way down to the common iliac, okay? You've got to go all the way down to the edge of the common iliac and take all the nodes down to there. Um, and uh, so obviously if they have renal pelvis and proximal ureter, that's the extent of the dissection. That was the answer to the question that you guys had earlier. And then for the distal ureter, really for those that are below the iliac nodes, you have to do a pelvic node dissection. You don't need to do external iliacs or things like that unless you've got um, nodes that are down, or uh, involvement down below the distal ureter. And this is one of the reasons why the ureteroscopy and the mapping is so important because now you know where is the tumor in the ureter, what do I have to do at the time of node dissection as far as taking nodes out. Why do a node dissection? Here's the data. So we went through and redid all the data, it did a huge, our, our uh, methodologist did a great job of going through and looking at all the data for node dissection uh, in upper tract disease, showing clearly that there is a, a survival benefit and recurrence-free survival. So doing a node dissection in your patient translates directly to a clinical benefit. Um, this is one of those things where we've argued and fought about this for years about whether it's the same in upper tract. I really don't know why, because bladder cancer, we do it for bladder cancer, and it's you know the common pathway of metastasis for bladder cancer. People, for some reason, kind of felt upper tract, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to do my nephro-U, take some regional nodes, and I'm done, because people felt like we don't have a good mapping strategy for upper tract. Well, we have that data, and so you really have to do it. Um, and all the, the details of what, of what uh, Dr. Hoffman sent us to talk about before, as far as our neoadjuvant trials, those neoadjuvant trials were uh, very clearly neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to nephro-U and node dissection. It was a mandatory node dissection in those trials. So it wasn't just nephro-U, you know, neoadjuvant before nephro-U. Um, it was neoadjuvant before nephro-U and node dissection. It's an important part of the operation. As far as the ureterectomy and bladder cuff, you should do a, uh, a, a bladder cuff, formally entering the bladder, and then as far as intravesical chemotherapy, uh, definitely give intravesical chemotherapy after nephro-U. It, um, it is recommended strongly. Um, as far as ways to approach this, we talked about some of the extravescal approaches, intravescal approaches, a lot of us are doing this, but clearly dissect the ureter all the way down through the detrusor into the urethelium, 
Uh, make sure that the bladder is fully emptied um, you know, before you detach the ureter. So make sure the catheter is irrigating freely, the catheter is decompressed. Um, and then uh, if you're going to do extravesical approach, I put a purse string in around the ureter. I fully excise the ureter and then I pull the purse string closed and I do some additional layers to reinforce it. As far as giving the mitomycin in the bladder, here's the Admit C trial, clearly showing a benefit in terms of uh, giving mitomycin after nephrodectomy. They put mitomycin in a week after nephrodectomy in these cases. So patients came in, their pathway was patients go for nephro-U, they go home, they come back. Before we take the catheter out, we put the mitomycin in and take the catheter out. More people are moving that up to in the perioperative setting. So you get your surgery at the end of surgery, you close the bladder up, and then either in the PACU or in the operating room before the patient goes down, put the mitomycin in, clamp it, send them to the PACU, and then unclamp it. Um, you can, so there is some data that moving up the timing uh, may be better. So there are some uh, papers out there that demonstrate that that may be the case. So earlier use instead of the one week later use might be better. So here, the robot versus open uh, discussion. Equivocal data, so basically open, robotic, it seems we looked at this very clear, clearly and, and closely in our group uh, when we did the re uh, review, uh, didn't show much of a difference in terms of the two, so either one is fine. Yes, you should get a no dissection, we talked about that, the extent of the dissection is listed, cable to common iliac. Um, early clipping, there is some data out there that early clipping, but mostly it's expert opinion, but I think many of us are doing this now. Um, and uh, the redirectomy approach, uh, definitely you need to take a bladder cuff. And then as far as intravescal therapy, you know, mitomycin was the trial, but other people are using gemcitabine. Others uh, are also using uh, other agents. So uh, there are a variety of things you can use. It doesn't have to be, mitomycin is fairly expensive, by the way. So many of us use uh, gemcitabine, which is a much cheaper uh, alternative. And there's data from a randomized trial looking at, you know, looking at mitomycin versus gemcitabine showing that they're roughly equivalent. Um, this is just going to be a quick uh, video review of, of, of how, I, how I do it. So I clip the ureter early, so as soon as I get in, I go down, I clip the ureter. I've already mobilized the bowel. This is a right-sided case, so we've got the aorta and the cava exposed. There's the duodenum. We're going to just um, free that up. Then I follow a split and roll, just like we normally do for RPLND, split and roll over the aorta, take down the lumbars. I like to clip the artery for the kidney right at the intraocaval region. We strip right along the paraspinous um, uh, ligament, and then we split and roll the cava. So you want to, I like to mobilize fully behind the cava first, and then I go and split and roll, because what that allows me to do is mobilize this packet off the back of the cava, and then when I come from that far side, you'll see that I'm just able to just pull this up and lift it all out. And I leave my nodes packets intact. I don't subdivide them. Um, I don't, I, subdividing gives you more nodes on your pathology in the end, um, but I don't think it makes much of a difference. For the bladder cuff, you come all the way down circumferentially. I like to put the purse string suture in early, uh, right when I get down onto the wall. I put some Surgicel in to drop the ureter onto uh, at the end, so I'll, I'll take it. I make sure I go all the way in. I want to see that I'm in the bladder. The bladder is decompressed. I've checked. We've irrigated the catheter a little bit to make sure that it's working and it's, and it's empty. We then make sure we see the UO as we come around, dissect it off the detrusor. I drop it right on my little landing pad there. I fold that over it and, and move it out of the way, and then just you close up uh, with the purse string at the end. And you can get a nice watertight closure. I'll put a few extra stitches in at the end just to you know, close it up, you know, usually a three-layer closure. And actually, um, I can even take those catheters out. I'm taking their catheters out uh, within 48 hours, and these patients, uh, if they get a good closure, they'll do well. Sometimes your closure isn't perfect, and in that case, I send them home with a catheter for a week or two. But uh, if I get a really nice watertight closure and I think it's going to be a perfect closure, I'll, I'll take it out before they go home. So his pathology came back uh, after his chemo. He had CIS uh, in his residual CIS in his uh, in his kidney. Uh, his nodes were all negative. Does anyone have concerns about the fact that he has residual disease or has residual CIS? No one. No one. Everyone thinks that's okay. Is there any concern you have about the CIS being there? Any worries about what that might mean for him? Much higher bladder risk, correct. So his, his risk for uh, finding disease in his bladder down the road is much higher. So we're going to have to watch him very closely. Um, why does he have CIS? Why, why didn't everything respond? Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we don't give chemotherapy to CIS, so yeah. we're not expecting that that's going to respond. Yeah. So it's often an issue we find CIS commonly in these patients. Everything else melts away. So I'm actually happy about his response. I think it's great uh, that you know he has basically you know PT zero from his 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 uh, primary disease, but he's got residual CIS which is still there. That was that flat tumor growing in the upper tract. That was that disease that was giving you that high grade cytology before, and so it's no surprise that, that CIS is still there and residual afterwards. 
Um, so I don't have concerns about it, but I would say that he's at higher risk for bladder, so I'm gonna be watching him very closely and what should his follow-up be. So I'm not gonna go through the, you know, the, the risk stratified follow-up, it's, it's, it's kind of complex, but here is the follow-up table that's in the guidelines. So this is what you should probably print out and keep in your clinics for your nurses and other people when they say, well, what should his follow-up be? How often should he come back and so forth? And what should we do? So it's gonna be intervals of, you know, for patients with kidney sparing. So we broke it down into kidney sparing procedures versus post-nephroureterectomy because these are different follow-up pathways. If you're doing kidney sparing in low risk or high risk, your follow-up is gonna to have to include endoscopic evaluation of the bladder and the upper tract periodically. And then at some point that upper tract endoscopy people will sort of fall off a bit um, as uh, you're finding that you can follow them more with imaging and you don't necessarily have to keep scoping these guys all the time. Um, and it, but in the post-nephro use situation, you don't have the kidney to deal with, so it's a little bit more simplified, right? You're following the bladder and so forth, you're following with imaging, but for those patients who get nephro use, especially the high risks, those patients who have you know, PT2 greater you know, after uh, treatment, uh, those patients you're really worried about metastatic disease, so you really have to deal with you know, that aspect of their care. So maybe more frequent imaging, um, and uh, cystoscopy with the hope of trying to find any recurrences early uh, before they become a big problem. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, I would just make a comment that, you know, these intervals in terms of recommendations, we say three months, we say three months is this, again, guideline-based care is sort of like, you know, I don't want to say bare minimum, but it's sort of like, this is considered like, you need to do at least this. If you choose to scope patients earlier, that's fine. In my practice for patients with upper tract urethral carcinoma, when I treat them, as Dr. Raman pointed out, you know, with endoscopic treatment, I don't wait three months typically to go back and check them again. I'm usually back up there within four to six weeks looking inside their kidney because I want to make sure there's nothing there. And there was nice data presented yesterday showing that if you look back in those patients, um, that in up to 80% of patients, you will find there's still residual cancer after endoscopic management in the upper tract um, as a second look. So even though you may think you were successful, there's often disease there. Now you might say, well, if it's low grade, what's the big deal? I could have found it later and treated it later. That's true. But some of these patients will you know, move on to higher risk or high grade cancers uh, despite uh, excellent endoscopic care. So, um, and again, these follow-up recommendations assume that everything is normal as you go forward. So if everything is normal here, then you go to here. If something turns out that you have cancer here, then you go back and you, now you have to follow. So you may say, well, what do I do if someone said like, well, should we put in the guidelines what to do if they develop bladder recurrence? No, there's a whole bladder cancer guideline that covers that. We don't have to you know, you know, do the, you know, uh, recreate the wheel for that one. So follow the guidelines for bladder cancer you know, if the patients recur in the bladder. Um, we're specifically addressing the upper tract. But yeah, if they recur at any point in time, all of this falls apart and you have to go back and follow guideline-based management for what you're dealing with uh, from the beginning. Um, quick one, I'm gonna go through this one as quickly as I can, I got four minutes left. But um, So this is a 62-year-old woman, uh, low-grade cancer in the left distal ureter. She has a family history of gastric cancer. She has a great GFR, she has a biopsy, she has a, a mass causing hydro, below the iliac vessels and significant left hydronephrosis. This is what it looks like. She's clearly got hydro. Further studies, what do we do? We did MMR testing, uh, management discussion with this patient, what options are available. It's low grade, we could consider endoscopic management in this patient, um, but we're also with a little bit of concern here, right? This is hydronephrosis in a patient with low grade disease. I showed you before those the, the graphs of low grade, you know, with hydro or without, she's in a poor prognostic category because of the hydro. So uh, I'm worried about that. And also, uh, if she comes back as a Lynch-positive patient because she has a family history of gastric cancer, uh, it's likely that she's got Lynch, then my concern is she's got urothelium at risk you know, of, of developing more cancers down the road. So endoscopic management, certainly kidney sparing management is a good approach here, but what's the best kidney sparing management? And does she need chemotherapy? questionable, right? So there is some uh, data suggesting that these patients with MSI high tumors may be eligible for certain types of chemotherapies, specifically checkpoint directed therapies that may be effective in MSI high tumors, um, but does she need chemotherapy? So we did the testing, she came back positive for Lynch, 
we offered her distal ureterectomy. And I said, you know, we can have different choices here. I can go up there endoscopically and try and treat, but you know, with, with even low grade, but with hydro, I'm a little bit concerned about what you might have behind all of this. And so I think doing a distal ureterectomy is probably a better choice in your case than going up endoscopically. While certainly some people can manage this endoscopically, um, I would say, you know, with this type of disease, it's, it's a little bit, you have to keep in your mind, it's a little bit worrisome. The biopsy was low grade, cytology was negative, but is there something else happening there? Um, and so we sent her for genetics referral. And we, she met with our medical oncologist. They said, well, there could be an indication in this situation for because you have an MSI high tumor that there may be certain types of therapies available to you. Um, but she deferred and said, you know, if, if we're taking my ureter out, why don't we just you know, do that and, and we'll see what we have uh, afterwards. So we did a distal ureterectomy and a re-implant. Uh, we did an extra vesicle excision. We took out the left ureter. How I do that is I put an endoscope up the ureter actually, you know, and you can put the, the flexible ureteroscope in the ureter. You can thread it up the ureter at the start of the case. You can leave it in the bladder. I actually put a catheter in beside it so that way I can keep the, the bladder decompressed. But then I can do picture in picture. I can actually take the video feed off the endoscope put it in through the robot, put it in picture in picture in the bottom, and then we can slide the scope up and down inside the ureter and I can find the exact location of where the tumor is and where I need to make my in, uh, incision. So I do that um, for all these cases and I think that helps me just better understand instead of sort of the, the guess of, of where to go. And then um, afterwards her pathology came back as T2. So this was T2 high grade, hiding out in a background of low grade cancer. So this happens in upper tract. It tells you about the problems we have in, in biopsy and so forth. So something to keep in mind. She was referred for adjuvant treatment and ended up getting uh, adjuvant therapy. So, um, so that's it. Uh, I'm going to end it there. I'm going to just leave up our summary slide for take home messages. Node dissection for high risk, absolutely. Templates are in the guideline. Please look it up. Uh, pelvic nodes for tumors in the lower third. Uh, installation of chemotherapy after nephro use should be performed. Make sure you do the bladder cuff as we talked about. MMR testing universally now is being recommended. So it may not happen at your center right away, but you can be the advocate for making sure that your pathologists do this in your patients. If you're not getting MMR testing, tell them, I'd like you to MMR test every biopsy that I do in patients with upper tract, endoscopic biopsies, every nephro U case that I do. I can find patients who have it. It helps me screen them better. It helps their family members because we'll find young kids who have it and they can be screened so that way they don't find out later in life that they've got metastatic endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer, metastatic gastric cancer. You can save lives by doing this. Um, and then follow-up uh, should be risk stratified. Tell your pathologist this is a billable test if they do MMR testing. It's not a genetics test. It's an MMR IHC test. It's more billing for them. They can collect for it. They're happy with that. Tell them, hey, good news, something you guys can do, and it's going to be helpful for everybody. Thanks. Oh, sorry, if there's any last questions, um, I know we're a little over time, but, um, but uh, I'll, we can take them either outside or why don't you go ahead and throw it up. So uh, doing the uh, biopsy, any uh, better trick? Because sometimes we don't find we can, you know, the depths may be not enough to show the uh, some mucosa tissue. So we I have difficulty in finding the superficial tumor versus the deeper tumor. And sometimes we might just get the low, uh, the low risk one, and, and there's maybe some high risk or the, the, uh, the so CIS say, so, that cannot be shown. Yeah, so the techniques are like, so when you do your biopsies, so I, get a, I often get a cytology before I do a biopsy. Then I'll do my biopsies. I try and get as much tissue as I can. I biopsy several different sites. And then after my biopsy, I'll do a barbitage and I'll do a washing and take more cells out. And sometimes my post-biopsy barbitage specimens have cells in them that are high grade and they help. That's why we kind of focused on you know, the biopsy and the cytology because cytology will add more information sometimes to your, to your data. But the staging issue in terms of getting underneath to get staging in upper tract is almost impossible, very unreliable. So I think we have to, and I can talk off, off the side, we can do that. Thanks so much.